ओके सो वेरी गुड इवनिंग टू ऑल ऑफ यू हेलो अनिता हेलो विजयलक्ष्मी लेट मी सी हाउ मेनी ऑफ यू आर हियर दिस इवनिंग टू रिवाइज चैप्टर नंबर फोर fine okay so uh, are you all ready i hope uh, all of you are actually studying for your uh, upcoming uh, june attempt and uh, let us now start uh, quickly with chapter number 4 uh, chapter number 1 2 and 3 we have already done uploaded on youtube you can watch it uh, any number of times uh, any topic any point you have doubt you can uh, get in touch with me with the numbers in on the whatsapp on the whatsapp or the telegram channel okay and yes let us now start with the uh, chapter number 4 okay the name of the chapter is e commerce m commerce and emerging technologies so what i have done here is uh, we have we have divided the chapter into three parts as all of you can see that first part we are going to deal with e commerce and m commerce then we are going to discuss uh, digital payments and then we have the concept of emerging technologies the third part okay so uh, this topic uh, topic number 1 and 2 is very very easy uh, e commerce m commerce digital payments uh, not technical at all and emerging technologies some topics you may find it technical but uh, the the chapter it, itself is very interesting and very scoring also okay so now let us quickly start with the first concept the first concept is e commerce and m commerce okay we all know what e commerce means e commerce is the process of doing business electronically and when i say m commerce so m commerce is doing business electronically buying and selling of products and services using handheld devices it can be your mobile phone it can be your tablet okay so now e commerce and m commerce i'm assuming that you all know what it means okay we have already discussed now in this section in e commerce and m commerce topic okay we have in total uh uh we have to cover uh, i think 6 7 8 9 yeah 12 topics in total 12 topics okay so in e commerce and m commerce overall this is the master char chart that we have we have 12 topics here and we are going to start with very simple topic of benefits okay so what are the benefits uh, of e commerce and m commerce so let us quickly do it okay now again benefits uh, what i have done here is benefits we have divided the benefits into two parts three parts okay so what are the benefits of e-commerce to the business entities the ones who are actually doing uh, e-commerce business what are the benefits to the customers the second aspect and we are going to discuss some other residual benefits as well okay so let us now discuss what are the benefits of e-commerce to business entities the one who are actually doing e-commerce okay so uh, it is obvious that if you uh, bring your business on the online platform if you it is going to expand your customer base you will be able to reach out to more customer customers across the globe with, without any geographical boundaries okay and then first point is increased customer base the second point which we have to understand is with respect to reduced okay so the ones who are actually conducting business online okay so the it is going to reduce time for transactions the the customer immediately pays online the vendor the seller the e-commerce business persons they receive the money so reduce time for transactions then the operational costs are going to be uh, very less uh, because you don't have to open a showroom and pay expensive monthly rents uh, so uh, your operational cost is going to go down overhead cost also is going to be very less uh, as such you don't need to have salesmen and all to sell your product here okay and uh, uh yeah and because of automation because everything is now automated the sales uh, the sales is going to pour in automatically the invoices are going to be generated automatically we will have will be having less of uh, overhead expenses okay and inventory is also as such you don't need to uh, keep it uh, uh, in these days what is happening is let's say i am a i am a vendor listed on an e-commerce uh, portal the moment i receive an order i take i i basically buy the uh, item from my supplier and then 
then I sub basically deliver it to you. Okay, so immediately st immediate storage of uh, inventory is also now not required. Okay, all right. So these are the four points with respect to reduce. So I can say reduce time for transaction, reduce operational cost, reduce overhead cost, and reduce inventories. Okay, now because because of e-commerce now uh, it is easy to enter into the new markets as well the ones who are uh, let's say doing a traditional business by having a brick and mortar shop the, their geographical uh, area limitation they have a restriction okay but now because of internet it is easy to enter into the new markets okay and obviously the advertisement is also going to be very it is going to improve basically you will be able to do target marketing you know that your products let's say it belongs to uh, age group of 20 to 25 so probably you are going to now market more on instagram in fact these days the tiktok app is also becoming very popular so you know the right platform now where you have to market now if the product let's say it is for uh, teenagers and you keep on giving ad in newspapers now so the, the nobody reads newspapers teenagers and all they hardly read newspapers so if our business is on the internet we can choose the right platform and we can do the target marketing okay so these are the benefits to the business entities okay so in all in all how many benefits I have for the business entities uh, four points with respect to reduce four five six seven points I have okay now what are the benefits to the customers you when you buy a product online what are the benefits that you get okay so you also so somehow when you purchase things online there is a cost reduction you you get it somewhat cheaper okay because there is a lot of competition online you you tend to get price you tend to get uh, the products at a, a cheaper rate and because there is no middleman involved as such also the cost is less okay and uh, uh, yes, so reduce in time to get goods. So you the cost is also uh, less and the time when you get when you can get the goods is also reduced So I think there is some uh, mistake here uh, It says reduction in time. Okay reduction in time. So in less time you'll be able to get the goods Okay, better quality of goods again because of competition you can now uh, on you you know all this Okay, you have been doing shopping online so you can see the reviews you can see the feedback of the uh, previous customers and all and then accordingly you can make a decision whether you want to purchase the product or not okay so better quality of goods when then we have various payment options also these days cash on delivery is available you can pay using uh, your credit card your debit card net banking is there now you can make payments through various upi apps okay then obviously it is convenient for you you don't need to travel and go to the shop physically you can access the market online anytime anywhere you want whether it is uh, uh, post midnight anytime okay and yes coupons and all they keep on the vendors they keep on issuing coupons and all attractive discounts and offers they keep on giving you so it becomes easier for us and uh, we become happy also when the coupon is applied okay successfully now these are the benefits to customers okay now what are the other benefits let's see uh, yes now other benefits is reduction in ecologically damaging material now let's say because these all the transactions are then online okay now let me give you the example of flipkart initially flipkart back in 2014-15 okay when you buy a product from flipkart they used to send the product and on the packaging of the box they used to send the invoice also okay they would print the invoice on an a4 size paper then they would cover it with a plastic and then they would stick it on the box okay now what is happening here is because of now what has happened is e-commerce these days they send you the invoices through emails okay so there is reduction in the paper use there is reduction in the plastic use everything so we we can say that this is one more benefit of e-commerce that ecologically damaging materials are no longer used and obviously there is a uh, e-governance now when e-governance when i talk about e-governance i can say transparency in government activities also and reduced corruption now everything when it has become online even you let's say you have to uh, 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 you form a, you want to form a company okay so now you can do everything online earlier we had to go to the roc's office do a manual filling of the forms and submit it and so now what has happened there is increased level of transparency there is no corruption as such okay so a very simple topic we have covered what are the benefits of e-commerce there is nothing much to explain here so just remember the three major heads of benefits one is to the business entities to customers and other benefits done okay now let us start with the second topic again a very very simple topic how are you going to compare e-commerce to the traditional commerce the traditional brick and mortar shops okay so what i've done here is in your material we we have dimensions basically we have the difference 
between e-commerce and traditional commerce but what I have done here is I have just written the dimensions here okay so if you are able to remember these eight dimensions you will be able to write the answer well so in first point you have to write the meaning of e-commerce and traditional commerce okay now what is traditional commerce traditional commerce includes all those activities which encourage exchange in some way or the other through physical exchange of goods manual exchange of goods will be there or service will be there okay e-commerce we have already discussed carrying out business electronically is e-commerce okay now area and scope if i talk about area and scope obviously the one who's having a traditional shop his area and scope will be reduced will be limited to that particular area of the city or at a max that city okay but when you do business online your area you can, the scope is the entire globe you can sell your product anywhere on in the across the globe okay as far as availability is concerned the traditional shops they have a restriction on this okay they are available for limited time during a day let's say the business hours but online uh, e-commerce platforms are available to you 24 7 okay obviously in traditional uh, shops the transaction processing is manual uh, you pay in cash or you swipe whatever he gives you a manual invoice whatever it is there is man-to-man -man interaction involved okay but in e-commerce the entire transaction processing is automated okay one advantage of traditional commerce is that you can inspect the product physically first and then take a decision whether you want to buy it or not this is now lacking in e-commerce so e-commerce you just see the picture of the product and then you buy it okay now customer interaction in e-commerce uh, in traditional commerce there is face to face interaction between the customer and the shopkeeper okay but in e-commerce there is no face to face interaction but i can say there is face to screen interaction most of us we generally see the screen of our phones or tablets or laptops and then we see the products photo and then we buy it okay okay payment options these is more or less the payment options are uh, same in both the scenarios uh, you can use the traditional methods you can go with cash uh, in traditional methods you can pay in cash you can give a check you can swipe debit card credit card you can now pay using upi apps you can use paytm etc so same same is there in e-commerce also okay one one more advantage of traditional commerce is that the uh, along with inspection of goods you if you like the product you can buy the you, you get the product immediately so delivery is immediate but in e in case of e-commerce the delivery might take certain time but in some big cities like amazon assures one day same day delivery guarantee also so e-commerce is uh, a big thing now they, they also are into the same day de delivery concept okay so please remember the eight dimensions here and you'll be able to write the answer okay all right so now moving ahead now e-commerce workflow this is a very simple question but this was also asked in the exam and they were and you uh, they asked to even draw the workflow diagram so remember okay we have a diagram in our book so we all know that the customer first logs in okay and then he chooses the product product service or selection is done then he adds the product to the cart okay the uh, product is basically added to the cart so that means uh, he the customer places the order the order placement will only be confirmed when you pay when you select a payment method okay either you pay immediately online or there might be cash on delivery option also so then we have payment gateway okay once once the vendor once the e-commerce vendor receives your order he is going to dispatch basically do the shipping and meanwhile uh, till the time you receive your goods till the time you receive your goods you you will be having a, a delivery track id basically of the courier company you can track also okay so there are two tracking here involved delivery tracking probably you will be more excited to receive the product so you will be constantly monitoring the uh, product where it has reached but at the same time if let's say the order was on the basis of cod cash on delivery okay so i as a vendor would be also uh uh, basically i would also be keep, i'll also keep a watch whether okay i have received the money the courier company basically will be collecting the money from you okay and then they are going to basically transmit the money to us okay so i need to keep a track on the cod transactions also okay so these are the six very simple very simple uh uh, uh, uh basically steps uh, in e-commerce workflow i can say so you log in first then you select the product you place the order payment gateways there dispatch and ship shipping takes place and delivery tracking and cod can take place okay similarly for this is the scenario like even i have uh, if you want to see like uh, this is our e-commerce portal edulaunch.in wherein all my products are listed here we have courses in hindi in english language uh, some combo products i also sell my books online so any student he has to 
log in first then there is a card button you can see here so they add the product to the card and then the place the uh, upon uh, uh, the payment gateway comes and upon receiving the payment we dispatch the goods so when we dispatch the student also receives a uh, courier consignment number so that he or she can keep a track so you all know this okay all right anyways now let us come to the next topic see we have already covered benefits we have compared how are you going to compare traditional we have completed how are we going to compare traditional e-commerce with uh, traditional commerce with e-commerce okay then third we have completed e-commerce workflow now very important question fourth point is components of e-commerce what are the various components of e-commerce i think this is an important question so we have six components of e-commerce six components okay so uh, very think um, understand it very logically there has to be a user a customer okay then there has to be a vendor who is selling the product the vendor will be the one who is going to actually handle the website the technology and all okay so there is a user the prospective customer then we have vendor then technology infrastructure now as a e-commerce uh, as a e-commerce let's say vendor i need to maintain a set of technology okay there would be servers there would be database okay and uh, let's say they, i might come up with mobile applications also uh, okay so these are the technology infrastructure that i need to maintain okay in order for you user to connect to my portal to my uh, website let's say we need to have an internet connection also the fourth component very important component is internet network because of this internet the communication between the customer and the e-commerce portal takes place okay so web portal is nothing but what i showed you is my web portal this is my web portal it is website basically okay all right so we need to have a web portal and finally we need to have a payment gateway all right so these are the six important components now what do you mean by payment gateway now payment gateways basically like in for example in our website we have uh, taken uh, because we cannot create our own infrastructure to receive and uh, basically send money so we take the assistance of a payment gateway payment gateway is a service provider they act as an intermediary between the seller and the buyer so what happens is the payment gateway is going to receive money from you and they are going to again reimburse the money to me after deducting their certain charges okay so payment gateways there so we have how many components six components the user the vendor technology infrastructure in technology infrastructure we are going to discuss technology infrastructure in detail if you can see this uh, point here we are going to discuss technology infrastructure in e-commerce in detail then internet network all, all of you know web portal is nothing but the website okay and we have payment gateway we can have various modes of payment cod uh, credit card debit card upi etc fine so these are the six components very important question six components of e-commerce remember that e-commerce workflow also has six steps and then components of e-commerce we have uh, six components okay now uh, there is another very important question here uh, we have just see again uh, point number two and three okay of the components of e-commerce point number two and three of the components of e-commerce we have a separate question on them if you can see the next topic it is role of e-commerce vendors it is role of e-commerce vendors here okay and if if uh, this technology infrastructure also we have a separate topic technology infrastructure in e-commerce so the next two topics is nothing but we are discussing these two components of e-commerce in detail here okay so they may ask you a question what is the role of e-commerce vendor okay in the entire e-commerce process what are the what is the role of e-commerce vendor what all things he has to manage and maintain okay so we have 10 points here to understand very simple uh, understand it very logically okay now let us take the example of amazon.in amazon.in is an e-commerce uh, vendor okay amazon.in sells product itself they have their product they sell it uh, amazon products and all they, they, they themselves are one of the sellers but along with them there are a number of other third party sellers who are actually who have listed their products on the amazon portal okay so amazon has to manage all the suppliers all the suppliers okay so there might be many other third party suppliers amazon itself is a big supplier okay so they have to you have to manage the vendors have to manage the suppliers okay uh, all the suppliers who are actually there on let's say amazon.in that they have to be reputed suppliers they amazon needs to ensure that when an order is received they actually deliver the goods to the uh, customer okay so that is why if you see there are ratings of the suppliers also okay 
and uh, Amazon keeps a track uh, on uh, the performance of the suppliers whether they are actually working as per all the terms and conditions or not so first point is supplier management then the Amazon needs to ensure that all the products are properly displayed on the portal okay so product catalog and display they have to work on this and uh, they keep on changing it as per the season as per the uh, festivals that are coming as per the sale period and also the product catalog the display the home page it keeps on changing okay now along with this warehouse operations now when you place an order uh, on amazon portal the the order is received in the warehouse okay uh, then what happens is entire warehouse operations uh, takes place let's say the product is now picked from the shelf where your uh, product is actually kept it will be packed and then the delivery person will come and take it so all this is warehouse management okay now warehouse management most of the big companies like amazon alibaba and they, they have automated the entire warehouse operations also and the, their entire warehouse operations is now taken care by robots okay so the moment an order is received robots go to the uh, right shelf they pick the product and they drop the product in the packing area the packing is done and the delivery person it uh, comes and takes your product okay then obviously they the vendors need to work on different ordering methods you as a vendor as a vendor we need to provide the customers with all possible payment methods that are available be it cash on delivery or through credit cards or debit cards or uh, through net banking or um, the upi apps or the wallets that we have these days amazon pay etc okay then uh, shipping and returns okay vendors they also have to manage this shipping and returns okay shipping is a very important component if the shipping is not done in the right time the customer is not going to receive the products in uh, the estimated time and as such uh, this would uh, bring this would this might compromise with the uh, goodwill of the organization okay so shipping has to be done properly as well as return policies has to be properly drafted okay then comes guarantee loyalty programs guarantee and loyalty programs okay now generally what happens let's say in amazon you buy a uh, let's say you purchase a television of sony okay now the guarantee will be given by sony okay so uh, there has to be clear cut description written that the yeah, guarantee is taken by Sony or Amazon.in. Okay, so guarantee and all they have to check. There are sometimes offers on money back guarantee that if you are not satisfied with the product, they are going to uh, return you back your money or whatever it is okay so guarantee is there then we have loyalty programs okay so if you if you make repeated purchases okay they keep on adding some loyalty this this happens in some websites they keep on adding some loyalty points in your account and uh, that points you can redeem by making for some future purchases okay so loyalty programs is basically uh, done it is a marketing uh, uh, technique I can say uh, to basically uh, make repeat ensure that the customers make repeated purchases okay all right then we have showroom and offline purchases now these days many e-commerce vendors because I dare tell you or not that in e-commerce there is one drawback that the goods cannot be physically inspected okay before you may, uh, buy it okay so in order to resolve this issue many e-commerce vendors they have come up with showrooms also for example lenscart.com lenscart basically it's a spectacle show so we have showrooms of lenscart wherein you can go and try different kinds of specs and then in those showrooms also you have to place the order online they will uh, they'll give you ipads and all wherein you can place the order so the, these showrooms are more or more of like display centers okay pepperfry.com they also have their display centers in many cities in india okay so showroom and offline purchases and two very important points is privacy policy and security policy in any e-commerce uh, website we have to have a privacy policy wherein you mention that whatever data uh, we receive from customers let's say i'll be receiving your name your phone number your address whatever data i receive your purchase history i'll keep it confidential i'm not going to share it with any third party any website so even in our website we might be we must be having a privacy policy see there is an option here privacy policy okay the terms and conditions so so any e-commerce vendors we have to have a privacy policy and we have to have uh, security uh, we need to maintain security also okay so when you when you uh, add the product to the card and when you are about to make a payment the the credit card details or the debit card details you uh, type in basically it, and the entire process has to be done in a secured manner so we have ssl layers etc that we implement in order to enhance in order to enhance the security experience okay so in our website also let's say we we have uh, implemented this aspect and that is why we have a point here also 
let's see secure ordering okay so this is another work of vendor that he needs to ensure privacy of all the customers and he has to ensure security okay so we have 10 points this can be asked don't have to remember all the 10 points but yes this is very practical that the vendor has to manage the suppliers and he has to uh, catalog the product okay and display he has to manage the products okay then warehouse operations is there different order ordering methods can be used now shipping and returns he has to uh, uh, take care guarantee loyalty programs then if, if they have come up with uh, showrooms also they have to manage that as well and privacy policy and lastly we have a point security fine so this was role of e-commerce vendors okay so out of 12 topics we are already done five topics see the concept is very very easy okay nothing technical as such okay now let us come to another topic technology infrastructure in e-commerce okay now these two topics again let me tell you these two topics are nothing but we are discussing components only okay we have discussed component two in detail role of vendor now we are going to discuss technology infrastructure the component number three in detail okay so technology infrastructure in e-commerce now let us start this okay so any e-commerce vendor needs to maintain certain technologies certain infrastructure so what are the technologies very simple uh, obviously let's say if i am an e-commerce vendor i'll need to have computers i'll need to have server i need to keep a database of all the products with proper description uh, validity period the pricing etc so i need to maintain servers database etc okay you don't have to understand this point in detail there is no further explanation as such required here okay second point is i need to maintain mobile application or a mobile website a mobile website okay now this is an important point and a, for a separate question from be can be asked from this part okay now what is a mobile app or a mobile website okay now mobile apps you all know okay now mobile apps basically what happens is now if let's say I have a mobile app edulaunch.in so you don't have to type in edulaunch.in again and again and visit the website what you can do you can straight away open the app and all the products and all will come there you all know this you you have your amazon flipkart app in your mobile phones okay but now what happens is making an application making a mobile app is an expensive proposition okay and on top of that there are various users if i develop an android app ios users uh, will not be able to use it if i only develop an ios apple app android users will not be able to use it and in order to make apps for both the platforms it is going to be very expensive okay so now because most of the internet traffic is uh, uh, basically generated through mobile devices now i should at least ensure that if i don't have a mobile application at least i need to ensure that my website is mobile device compatible now what do i mean by mobile device compatible uh, now <coughs> sorry now this website here which you can see here i have opened it on a desktop now when i open it on a mobile phone uh, because this is the resolution and all is for a desktop big screen but if i open it on a mobile phone because the screen size is small it should automatically adjust the display and all should automatically adjust to fit into the screen size of the mobile or the tablet so this is a mobile website so what i'm trying to say you is if in case let's say we don't have a mobile app at least we need to have mobile website okay but an um, important question which i feel can be asked from this part very important question is uh, what are the modules what are the various modules of mobile apps okay so if i have a mobile app what are the various modules that should be there what are the various components at least that should be there in mobile apps super important question okay so how many modules we need to have in any mobile application we need to have five modules at least okay so what are the name of let's understand the names of the module first first is front module ticketing module then we have advertising or marketing module then we have customer support and information module and finally we need to have payment or banking module but what is front module front module is something which the customer sees wherein all the products are displayed basically the catalog okay so front module if i say it is nothing but the catalog wherein you can see the products okay now second is ticketing module now ticketing module basically deals with the promotional aspects all the coupon codes which you receive the vouchers which you receive and then when you add the product to the card you can apply the coupons and vouchers this is taken care by the ticketing module okay all right third is advertising module it manages all the marketing activities online campaigns if you are running if you are running ads okay on instagram whatever it is okay so online marketing manage the marketing campaign now please don't get confused between module number two and three two is 
or promotional aspects with respect to coupons and vouchers okay and third specifically is advertising or marketing module it manages the entire marketing campaigns okay fourth is customer support and information module now i told you this that e-commerce vendors they need to manage a lot of suppliers okay now when you click on a supplier you will be able to see the suppliers basically data history uh, his ratings everything so this is nothing but information module it will store basically information about a retailer a particular product whatever information you get or services deals the let's say if you're buying a t-shirt the washing instructions uh, everything okay so this is information module okay and finally and finally we have payment or banking module this has to be there in order for the vendors to receive the payment okay so uh, yes in short this I feel this is a very important question for the upcoming attempt what are the modules of a mobile application so front module front module ticketing module advertising or marketing module then we have customer support and information module and finally we have payment or banking module okay all right so what are what is the question that we were actually discussing sir we are still on the topic of technology infrastructure in e-commerce okay and we have uh, we have four topics here computer servers already discussed then we have mobile apps we have already discussed this then digital libraries i feel a short note can be asked from this part digital library what is digital library you just have to remember collection of digital objects collection of digital objects okay if you remember in class also i must have told you in detail the difference between a digital library and a database don't get confused with database digital libraries collection of digital objects like videos or music etc let me give you an example okay now if i have a folder in which which in which i have kept 100 songs 100 songs mp3 songs okay now this is a collection of my song this can be termed as digital library it is not a database of my songs okay this is a collection of my music so this can be termed as digital library but when i talk about database each song in which year it was released uh, the song is from which album who has sung the song all these things if I maintain this is going to be the database okay so collection of just the mp3 files will be digital library and information with respect to each of the files will be my database okay so the main purpose of database is to basically facilitate the searching part now if you want to search for a uh, song by the name of the singer you search and it will be available okay so there is a difference okay all right now data interchange obviously uh, there has to be some technology for exchange of data okay uh, or else you will not be able to connect to my website you will not be able to connect to my server you will not be able to see the various products okay so the to in order for the e-commerce transaction to take place we have to have some mechanism of uh, uh, electronic data interchange okay so this is data interchange all right so we have uh, uh, four technology infrastructure we have done with four technology infrastructures okay now out of 12 topics in e-commerce we have already covered six topics okay we have already covered six topics we are left with six more topics six more simple topics but before again I move forward how many of you are uh, there let me let me just check are you able to follow the lecture or not isn't this topic very easy? Yes, uh, Vijay Lakshmi, Asha, Urmila, Kanta. All right. Okay. Okay. Fine. Great. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for replying. Yes. All right. Okay. Now I have an idea. Okay. There are some viewers who are watching at least. Okay. Fine. So uh, six topics we have covered. Now moving ahead. Very important. Another, another very important topic which we are going to discuss now is the network architecture for e-commerce. Uh, network architecture of e-commerce if I say. Now what is what do you mean by network architecture? Network architecture basically means uh, the design, the method of construction I can say. Uh, but the, uh, how the network is basically architected or let's say is designed okay so in e-commerce no you, we can have two types of architecture okay one is two tier architecture and the other one is three tier architecture now in two tier architecture what happens is uh, in two tier architecture if i say uh, okay we have two layers now when i talk about two tier tier means nothing but layers okay so the the first layer is basically the client 
the client layer the client tier i can say okay now this will be let's say your computer okay and then we have a database tier where from all the data regarding products and all will be received okay uh, this is two tier architecture and if i go back to the topic uh, yeah okay so in two tier architecture how many let's say how many layers we have how many tiers we have we have two tiers one is presentation and the other one is database okay so if you see the diagram again the client tier basically its responsibility is of presentation okay and this is basically the database layer now what happens please understand uh, okay if we if we go with the two tier architecture what you see on your your mobile phone what you see on your mobile phone okay uh, this this basically this interface this is this allows uh, basically users to interact with e-commerce or m-commerce vendors you can log in uh, to an e-commerce vendor through this tier okay so what you see in in your laptops can be termed as presentation information is actually presented to you in this particular layer and the data from which the information is actually uh, presented to you the 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 structure from which the data comes we can call it as database layer okay so a database tier is basically all the data with respect to the product the price the customer database will be stored in the database tier okay this is a simple two tier architecture we can have e-commerce on this on this type of architecture also but now let us understand another architecture which we have to understand the three tier architecture in three tier architecture we have uh, instead of two tiers two layers we have three layers here okay what are the three layers we have presentation we have database but we have additional application layer in between okay so in three tier architecture we have one more layer in between what is the layer let us understand now in the uh, with the help of diagram we have the client tier okay because the keyboard is attached i'm having difficulties in writing okay client tier we have the client tier okay all right and uh, yes so client tier is will be my presentation layer okay then we have an application server we have an application server this is known as application layer okay and then we have a database tier so please understand now what is happening here is uh, what you see on your mobile phones and your desktops and your devices presentation this is done by the this is your computer okay so the presentation will take place here okay now let's say you you uh, you search for a product let's say you search for a pen you write pen and you you click the search button the processing the search part will now take place in the application layer okay and when the results are displayed to you the results will be displayed from this layer the database layer so what what has happened here is we had two layers in the previous case now we have three layers so what is going to happen you know in the first scenario this was also possible this this particular architecture is also possible in e-commerce but what happens is as and when the number of users increases okay uh, this system basically the performance deteriorates okay but here in this scenario what has happened we have uh, we have divided the entire workload into three parts okay so even if when the number of users increases keeps on increasing uh, they are able to manage the traffic lot lot better man in a lot better manner as compared to two tier architecture okay so when i talk about e-commerce now practically if i speak okay practically if i say so all e-commerce portals now work on three tier architecture because as and when the number of users are going to increase this three tier architecture is going to support okay so yes i have uh, i have covered this topic in uh, very briefly but uh, in our regular lectures we i take generally take a lot of time around a one hour lecture goes on in explaining the two tiers okay uh, so i believe uh, uh, whatever we have discussed now briefly it was sufficient for you to recall the concepts that we have already covered in the class okay so but just remember that yes there are two types of uh, architecture that is possible in e-commerce but now all e-commerce applications follow three tier architecture why because uh, in two tier architecture Texture, the performance deteriorates as and when the number of users increase okay so we need to have three tier architecture all right okay now uh, okay seven topics uh, we have covered now there is a topic on policy guidelines okay uh, uh, they can ask you a uh, they can frame a case and ask you a question on this that uh, a company is uh, uh, basically uh, coming up with a e-commerce uh, portal and 
you are an expert they seek your advice as to what all the what all various policies they need to keep in place in order for the smooth functioning of the entire e-commerce business okay so when i talk about policy guidelines any e-commerce vendor any e-commerce vendor need to have at least these six policies okay now what is policy policy if you remember the word policy and procedures policy and procedures are nothing but controls okay so uh, yeah, any e-commerce uh, per a person who is coming on the e in the e-commerce business, they need to have billing policy, okay, with proper GST and all product guarantee and warranty policies. They need to have. They need to have shipping policies. Therein, they state uh, the estimated time and all. What if the good is not goods are or products are not uh, delivered in time? What if they are delivered in damaged condition? Everything is written in the shipping policy. You must have also seen while you place orders on an e-commerce portal okay then we have delivery policy then return policy for which products the goods can be returned okay for let's say uh, some products they may not accept return again let's say if it is a food item or something they might not accept it again they might not return uh, accept the return so you need to check the return policy uh, how, return policy for how many days you can keep the product and then return some companies have a 30 day return policy some have only a seven days return policy so all this is written in the policies okay then payment policy how can you pay for example sometimes it happens that uh, you pay on uh, you pay using uh, cod option the cash on delivery okay but then you don't like the product and you want to return it so it is clearly mentioned in the policy document that if you have made the payment through cod and if you in case you return they are not going to return your money back in cash okay so they will either ask for your bank account or they will reimburse the money let's say refund you back the money in your amazon pay account or whatever mode you select right so all this is basically governed by policies so any e-commerce vendor minimum this this is not an ex this is not an exhaustive list okay this is just an illustrative list that yes these are certain policies that needs to be there but apart from these six policies policies that are mentioned in our ICI material okay billing product guarantee warranty shipping delivery policy return policy payment policy I want all of you to update in your copy that two most important policies that any uh, e-commerce vendor needs to have is again we have already discussed it that there has to be a privacy policy okay and one more policy which is really important is security policy okay so uh, even if it is not mentioned in our ICI material I, I want all of you to basically come up uh, to write point number seven and eight as well uh, because these has to be there this these are uh, these are very important policies that any e-commerce vendors need to have okay so these are the uh, policies that any e-commerce vendors need to create okay all right all right now coming towards the end let us now discuss the risk in e-commerce what are the various risks in e-commerce okay so again risk also we have divided uh, in three categories product or cost related then security related risk and then we have some risk with respect to legal aspects legal related risk okay similar similar to what we had covered in benefits benefits we had if you remember we had divided into three parts first benefit was with uh, to the business entities second to customers and then we had other benefits okay so risk also we have categorized into three parts so what are the risks associated with product or cost of the product let's see all right uh, yes sometimes you might have quality issues with the product what was displayed in the photo though when you receive the product they are totally different the color is different the material is different the feel is different okay so that there this can be a risk delay in goods and hidden cost now this point this is more relevant if you are uh, if you're buying goods from a let's say an international uh, platform let's say you buy it from amazon.com the us version of uh, amazon rather than buying it from amazon.in and sometimes it uh, you don't know how long it is going to take to ship the product from america to india and there might be a lot of hidden costs involved also because now it, it is going to come under the case of let's say import okay so there might be some customs and all taxes also applicable so delay in goods and hidden costs this is more pre prevalent when i uh, yeah when you buy goods from another country okay and third point is needs access to the internet okay if uh, uh, this is very uh, uh, simple if see e-commerce it lacks personal touch and you need to have internet in order to go for any e-commerce transaction okay now and the fourth point is infrastructure see along with technology infrastructure in order for the vendor to deliver goods let's say across india to the remote remotest of the locations there has to be along with technology infrastructure there has to be 
proper roadways railways and uh, commutation infrastructure basically so if the uh, roadways railways and all improve we shall be able to deliver goods across india to, to the remotest part of the country as well okay so when i talk about infrastructure it is not only uh, about the technology infrastructure but along with technology you need to understand that the uh, expansion of railways roadways airways it is also essential and this is going to enhance the e-commerce business okay all right so uh, product and cost related uh, 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 risk we have covered four points with respect to this let us now cover security related risk okay see credit card issues okay see any transaction that you do on the internet you must have heard a lot about the cyber crimes taking uh, place okay and especially during this lockdown time a lot of uh, scams are happening in the cyber world okay so uh, credit card issues and all when you make payment uh, through the credit card you need to ensure whether a secure you are paying through a secure channel or not okay so as a vendor also i need to ensure that whenever i am accepting payments from you the the mechanism has to be very secured okay problem of anonymity the the anonymity means what that users will not be able will not be able to identify and authenticate the users okay so uh, if if i tell you an example let's say in case of cod or uh, cash on delivery when was when it was in, initially introduced okay so let's say i place an order on flipkart.in uh, and I give your name and your address and I go with the COD option. Okay, so let's say I ordered 20 books So the, the delivery guy is going to come up with the 20 books to your doorstep and he's going to ask you for money But now because you have not placed the order the uh, the delivery guy is again going to take back the products that is not an issue, but did um, did flipkart incur cost or not in sending the product in sending the delivery guy again they are going to take back the product again a lot of cost will be involved okay so there had to be certain control so now if you remember that initially when the cod concept was introduced then they, they started initially you know what they did they used to give a call back basically uh, so once you place a cod order you'll immediately receive a call on your mobile phone from flipkart confirming the order an executive will call you and they'll confirm the order then this was replaced by the concept of otp okay and now they basically see your purchase history if they if they if they know that yes this is a genuine customer so as such there is no need for any further authentication okay so problem of anonymity will be there then lack of authenticity of transactions okay now you know uh, when this uh, in in us and all when the e-commerce boom started okay uh, what happened is a lot of fake websites were created with with products photo and all at unbelievable prices and you know what happened uh, is uh, customer sees the products at such low prices and basically he makes a purchase but the entire website the entire entity was fake so payment is received and when they receive payments the goods is never sent okay and they generate false fake invoices also so my point is that in case of e-commerce sometimes lack of authenticity of transactions the invoices and all generated you cannot determine the authenticity also okay all right data loss now these two points are with respect to these two points specifically they are they are risk not to the customers but to the vendors okay so if what if the entire database if what if the vendor loses the data okay what if an attack hacker attacks the server what if the website is hacked so all these are the risk which the vendors they have to face okay so these are the points with respect to security now how many points how many risk we have covered with respect to product and cost we have covered quality issues second delay in goods and uh, hidden costs is there access to the internet is required then we need to have infrastructure so four points with respect to product and cost okay then security related how many points we have five points credit card issues problem of anonymity that means identifying genuine user is a big issue okay then we have lack of authenticity of transactions okay uh, uh, it is not possible to determine whether the invoices and all generated are genuine or not okay then these two points specifically are with respect to the vendors oh, okay so security related point is also done now let us understand the risk in e-commerce related to legal aspects okay now reputation of contract reputation you all know like uh, see online also a contract is established buyers and sellers they, they form the contract okay now i place an order what if i uh, uh, i place an order and later on i can any anyway deny the uh, contract deny the basically this uh, the transaction okay so this is a reputation of contract then the third uh, next is lack of audit trails okay now e-commerce some vendors they may not keep 
uh, that e uh, the logs basically the logs of the entire transaction and all so some if something goes wrong they'll not be able to trace back they'll not be able to detect okay so audit trails if you remember i told you audit trails are logs okay and uh, how it is a detective control okay and third is problem of piracy okay now this is generally with respect to uh, copyright content and all you you know all this let's say uh, uh, there is a pirated version of movie which you can watch on some other website so any video and all which is uploaded if a movie is uploaded on a genuine website if a web series is uploaded then you can uh, the pirated versions are also available okay so problem of piracy is there okay so this is uh, risk with legal risk okay so very simple topic again risk in e-commerce so we have product related cost related or security related and then we have legal related okay fine now because we have just uh, covered the concept of risk okay let us uh, cover the concept of controls also okay under the concept of controls we have to understand three topics okay that in the entire e-commerce uh, process who are the parties that who who need to implement controls okay so in order for the entire e-commerce transaction to take place smoothly there there are various parties seven parties i believe they they need to implement controls okay so you as a user you need to keep a control make sure you never share your user id and password with anyone else okay and uh, second the sellers need to keep a control okay uh, sellers need to keep a control on the products the catalogs the prices it shouldn't happen that any hacker enters into a website and he changes the prices okay a thousand rupee product is now available in one rupee so if this happens so uh, the seller is going to have incur huge amounts of losses okay now the government needs to keep control as to the all the transactions because the government needs to collect the proper taxes okay so there needs to be proper control mechanism from the government's end as well all right now again in order for the entire uh, e-commerce transactions to be executed in a good manner okay the network service providers the internet service providers and all they need to have control okay now let us say uh, uh yeah uh, then the internet services the network should be available and it should be secured okay so when i talk about network service providers i need to remember two words that they should be available and it at the same time it should be secured so that the user when he enters his credit card information and all i receive them in a secure manner okay then network service is different and technology service is different network basically uh, please uh, understand that it is uh, uh, the controls has to be because because of the exchange of information okay between the user and let's say the vendor but when i talk about technology service providers technology service providers are let's say my uh, uh, the place where my website is hosted let's say uh, uh, the back end of my software everything the back end of my website this is all going to come under the database where i have kept all the products data this is going to come under technology so technology service providers the ones who are let's say i have taken a server on rent uh, uh, through a cloud service provider so cloud service provider will be my technology service provider okay then logistic service provider uh, my goods are ready i have packed it but what if the courier person or the logistics company they don't turn up so logistics uh, service providers also have to uh, have control so that they ensure timely delivery okay all right and then payment gateways this is really really very important uh, like for example i have taken the payment gateway from insta mojo so insta mojo needs to ensure that whatever transaction whatever money you are paying it has to be in a secured manner okay so se seven points is there uh, the topic is what is the topic that uh, in order to ensure smooth transaction smooth functioning of the e-commerce process entire e-commerce process all parties who are involved in the e-commerce they need to implement controls okay now who are the parties the users the sellers the government the network service providers technology service providers logical uh, logistic service providers and finally the payment gateways okay all right okay now uh, let us talk about implementation of controls how do we implement the controls okay the topic that we just covered the, the these were the parties who should be basically responsible for the controls okay but how do we actually implement the controls okay so the point here is we need to educate the participants who were the participants we have just covered we need to educate the participants about the nature of the risk okay now for example sometimes your bank keeps on smsing you that we will never ask for your pin we will never ask for your password when you open your bank's website they are going to give you certain warnings and instructions so basically this is what educating the participant about the nature of the 
risk okay then second is communication of policies to the customers okay we need to clearly communicate the policies to the customers they need to be aware of the return policy the privacy policy the shipping policy the delivery policy or the billing policy all the policies okay if if they are aware then there will be strict uh, adherence to all the policies and the, 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 we can say that yes controls are actually implemented we need to make them aware of uh, their responsibilities as well okay that they need to be updated they need to be aware that they, they shouldn't be sharing their passwords with anyone because these days what happens you know let's say uh, i'm using amazon pay also okay if i share my amazon password with my friend he will like have access to my amazon pay account also okay so that is why the users also need to be updated they need to be aware okay third is ensure compliance with industry body standards now ensure compliance now industry body standards i can say all the laws of the land we have to comply the gst the fema whatever act is applicable that that has to be complied with and we need to ensure that our e-commerce is uh, protected from intrusion now intrusion uh, basically we need to protect our portal uh, from viruses from hackers okay uh, we need to ensure that uh, we are keeping our software updated regularly so regular checks and scannings need to be done so this is how we can implement controls what are the points educating all the participants then communication of the policies only by drafting policies nothing will happen you have to articulate you have to communicate the policies to all the stakeholders okay third is ensure compliance with uh, all the laws all the applicable laws and fourth is you need to protect your system the entire e-commerce system from intrusion intrusion means a third party entering into your uh, unwanted person and unauthorized person entering into your systems okay all right then finally one control point that we have to understand here is so last topic is control objectives control objectives now uh okay all right i have a question uh, vinay has asked the question what is the difference between network service provider and technology service provider okay please understand vinay network service providers are basically the ones who uh, uh, are involved in providing and establishing the communication network wherein the data uh, the sending and the receiving of data takes place okay so your internet service provider can be a network service provider they need to ensure two things that the network is available and it is secured okay technology service providers are all the other service providers other than network service providers okay they may include your uh, uh, your server providers the hardware the cloud service providers okay they may include your uh, the application backend service providers i can say okay so so all all uh, vendors other than in our book also it is written in this way all vendors other than the network service providers are basically technology service providers okay i hope it is clear now all right so third topic under control objectives which we have to understand is uh, yeah what are the various control objectives once you implement controls what are the various control objectives okay so these points we have already covered this points i'll just uh, want you to understand the points see prevent organizational cost of data loss prevent loss from incorrect decision making prevent loss of computer hardware software and personnel prevent from high cost of computer error if you if you want to uh, uh, see let me let me show you do you remember that yes you have uh, covered all these topics somewhere yes you covered this topic this particular topic in chapter number 3 if i open the chart of uh, let me open the chart of uh, chapter number 3 yes if you remember we had covered the concept of uh, audit this uh, is audit okay and if you see here uh, yes we have a topic on uh, two topics okay one is objectives of is audit one is objective of is audit and then there we, we have need so if you see the first few points organizational cost of data loss incorrect decision making okay uh, high cost of computer error all these points these are same these are same that you have to write here okay uh, yeah let's take this organizational cost of data incorrect decision making loss of computer same points same okay and then the remaining four points are also same remaining four points we have covered uh, under the head of c is audit objectives asset safeguarding data integrity system uh, effectiveness should be maintained and system efficiency is also there so these eight points we have already covered okay now can i say is audit also a type of control or not yes audit is also a type of control internal audits is basically a control okay so when i say that what are the control objectives in e-commerce this means what what i am expecting when i implement controls okay so uh, 
the the purpose basically of implementing controls is to prevent organizational cost of data loss prevent loss from incorrect decision making prevent loss of computer hardware software and personal prevent from high cost of computer error so please remember these four points are uh, uh, taken from uh, need and uh, need of audit need of control and audit and these four points these four points are objectives of audit that we have covered it's asset safeguarding then ensure data integrity system effectiveness and efficiency objectives i'll take you again to this uh, portion see these are the four points that we have already discussed okay all right so uh, yeah but please this topic you know don't ignore this topic because this topic was asked in the exam this is an exam question that has already been asked what are the control objectives in e-commerce so please mark it as important okay all right so now uh, three topics with respect to controls are over okay what are the three topics who are the parties who should implement controls then how the controls needs to be implemented and finally we have a topic on control objectives okay all right then coming to the last topics last two topics are less very 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 simple topic okay what are the various laws governing the e-commerce okay so we have various laws you all know this that if it is a company the companies act will be applicable obviously because it is doing business the income tax act will be applicable the gst act then customs act indian contract act uh, if uh, doing transaction import export so foreign trade development and regulation act foreign exchange management act okay competition act consumer protection act rbi act will be applicable for the payments and all okay and information technology act is also going to be applicable so this is a very simple topic but please again i'm telling you again this question has also been asked in the exam what are the various laws governing an e-commerce so if it is asked in this particular item it is going to be a bonus for you okay all right and i hope i believe that you will be able to write at least two three lines in each of the uh, laws okay now last topic okay last topic this has been newly added uh, relevant from uh, this may 20 attempt and onwards newly added topic e-commerce business models okay so we have two topics here basically one is uh, what are the various e-markets okay and the other one is what are the various business models what are the various business models in e-commerce so let us first cover what are the various business models so there are very simple uh, models we have first is b2c we all know b2c means what business to consumer then we have b2b model business to business and then we have consumer to consumer model now in our module only three models are given but there can be other model models as well okay now when i talk about b2c amazon.in is a good example business to consumer okay when i talk about b2b for example alibaba.com you must have heard the chinese the website of the giant website the big, biggest b2b website of china owned by jack ma so alibaba.com can be said to be can be uh, termed as a b2b website okay now c2c website consumer to consumer okay if uh, let's say i want you to write one example of c2c uh, website one example of c2c business model let's see if you are able to write yes olx good yes olx is a good example wherein a consumer places list his product to be sold and another consumer buys it so olx is a good example okay ebay can also be an example wherein you can uh, list your products and somebody else will buy it okay great great yes sai lakshmi you are correct okay so uh, yes olx is a good example fine so we have three business models and uh, let us now discuss about various e markets okay so uh, what are the various e markets first is e shop e-shop e-shop is basically the individual portal the website that you visit okay uh, so e-shop is uh, a virtual store rather than going to a physical store when you go to a uh, website uh, which sells products it is it can be called as e-shop okay now there is a concept of e-mall wherein just like a mall a mall is a big infrastructure where you have multiple small outlets okay small shops similarly e-malls is a big infrastructure where we have multiple e-shops where we have multiple e-shops okay then e-auctions uh, you can uh, this is a portal okay this is a channel of communication wherein the bidders can bid and the the process of bidding will take place so we call it as e-auction portal is nothing but the website portal basically means the website buyer aggregators uh, you all know this uh, it brings in a big large number of individual buyers so that uh, 
yeah uh, if you if we go with the example can can you write example of aggregators the buyer aggregators this is a very uh, uh, new and upcoming this model very much prevalent now example of aggregator model is uber an aggregator model the uber uh, the company doesn't own one single car they don't own they have no drivers as such but they have aggregated everyone and made a huge platform so this is the benefit zomato and uh, uh, the swiggy and all these are the aggregator business uh, examples models okay all right then we have virtual communities virtual communities is also a marketplace now what happens let's say uh, the students who buy my EIS SM lectures okay so I make a community I make a telegram community or I make a Facebook community the ones who have bought lectures for May 20 I make a community and when then we do all the discussion so this is also uh, this is virtual community then e-marketing is there e-marketing uh, uh, doing marketing digitally then e-procurement is basically uh, uh, procuring all uh, all we, we do all the procurement activities we do all the procurement work online okay so the order is placed online the supplier sends the goods on uh, basically everything is managed online okay and then again further e-distribution so i want to distribute goods to all the distributors so they are going to place orders online or through apps and all so these three uh, points are as such uh, these these topics are as such not important but for the from the perspective of mcq you need to understand the terms that's it okay so these are the very e markets all right all right now with this uh, we have come we are complete we have uh, completed the 12 13 topics of uh, e-commerce and very simple concept okay any any subject you know any subject if you remember from the perspective of these charts if you make an overview of the entire uh, topic things becomes very easy okay so i now know that okay e-commerce has got 13 topics and these are the 12 13 topics that i need to understand okay all right now because now we have done with e-commerce topic let let's see what are the other two topics left in the chapter we have digital payments okay so very quickly now let us understand uh, the concept of digital payments okay what are the topics that we have to cover here only four topics okay first we are need to understand the meaning then we are need to understand the advantages the drawbacks of digital payments and then what are the various types of digital payments okay so you all know meaning the meaning that uh, it is a way of payment where payer and pay both use the digital modes to send and receive money i don't need to explain anything here okay now what can be the advantages of uh, digital payments let us go through this it is easy and convenient you can pay you don't need to carry loads of cash with you so it becomes easy for you to make the payment and you can pay and send from anywhere this is uh, true uh, yeah now because these days government government of india and all they are also promoting the digital india concept okay so sometimes when you pay online and when you pay through your cards and all you get a lot of cashbacks and all for example a very good example was uh, in the uh, petrol pumps if you use uh, your card to make uh, the payment you get, get keep on getting cashbacks okay all right then the best part is when you spend money online when you or, or let's say when you spend money digitally you don't need to keep an accounting record of okay 300 rupees where did i spend and all everything is the log is maintained electronically so if you want to make a payment for your phone of let's say 399 rupees you pay it and you can just put in a remark or obviously you'll be able to see that okay you made the payment on the geo website so uh, all the records are maintained okay so we can have written records and yes less risk okay now this is a very crucial point okay now please understand this that anything which is connected to the internet any payment that uh, rather than paying some someone physically if you are paying someone digitally obviously it carries more risk but because we are understanding advantages and because everyone wants to now promote digital payments it says it is less risky it is less there is less risk in advanced digital payments but you have to be very smart here i have mentioned one point only if you use it wisely okay so it is less risky only if you use it wisely all right otherwise you know the consequences all right okay now having understood the advantages let us consider a few of the disadvantages or drawbacks of uh, paying digitally uh, yeah it becomes very difficult for non technical persons people who are not really uh, familiar with smartphones or 
who have let's say who are not technically very sound who don't have who are not very educated they will have difficulty they will have problems okay so non technical people persons might have might face difficulties then risk of data theft i have told you this that uh, yes uh, some might might steal your credit card credentials uh, immediately your account balance can be they they may basically uh, siphon off all your money okay and then overspending yes when we don't carry cash but you are let's say you you are just uh, you are in a mall and you happen to see a t-shirt and you you tend to buy it okay even if you don't have cash virtually if i say you are carrying your entire savings bank account with you or your business account with you okay so in a way you are you are carry, carrying your entire money so generally when we carry cash uh, overspending happens okay so you need to control it all right so we are done with uh, drawbacks also uh, advantage is also done very simple topic very simple point okay now let us uh, quickly understand uh, the various types of digital payments okay so digital payments we have two types we have two types of digital payments okay one is traditional method and the other one is new method traditional methods if i say this is very simple net banking i'm sure all of you must have done it and we have a separate topic on this in chapter number 5 wherein we need to understand the process of net banking you log into the website then of the bank and whatever process you know then you know the credit card and debit card you know the difference okay debit card payment is immediately deducted from your savings bank account and credit card is in a in a way i can say it is a short term loan extended by a bank to you so your you need to pay the money after the credit period let's say of 40 45 days and e wallets are basically yeah uh, the various wallets airtel pay or amazon pay or i can also say yes uh, uh, the free charge the paytm etc these are all uh, e wallets okay so they come under traditional methods now Uh, let us understand the new methods that are there okay i feel the new methods are very important okay and a question has already been asked from this part also okay a case kind of question was asked uh, which is already there in our module so you go through all the practical questions that is there at the end of each chapter okay so the first new method is imps uh, uh, it is known as immediate payment service okay so this is a bank to bank transfer you need to log into your bank's website net banking and you can pay to any other bank account any other your your friends account etc so this instant interbank electronic fund transfer now please note that this is different from rtgs and neft rtgs and neft you can do it only in the banking hours in the banking hours but imps you can do it any time okay so this is why the name says immediate payment service that is why rtgs and neft are more of traditional methods but imps is a new method okay then we all know upi unified payment interface uh, okay now all of you must have used upi what happens in the upi app that you are using it is a system that powers multiple bank accounts into a single mobile application so you can use any upi app and you can add your multiple bank accounts to it okay and how, what are the steps of using upi you all know this first your uh, you have to register for mobile banking any bank account you have your mobile number should be registered then you need to download the app the second step then third you need to create your virtual address basically what is what what do you what do you mean by vpa vpa is your virtual payment address okay so it can be your email id also or i can also call it as upi id all right so we have to uh, yeah first point was register for mobile banking then download the app then you create your virtual payment address and then you do the transaction okay so this is how simple a upi app can be okay now please write few examples of upi apps examples of upi apps any particular upi app which you are using please write the examples everyone Google Pay, Beam, okay. Beam is a good example. 
Beam is a good example and uh, uh, for Beam we you know Beam we have a separate note can also be asked uh, because uh, Beam uh, app is uh, actually promoted is made by the government of India so Bharat interface for money Beam stands for Bharat Info interface for money okay so you all know you have been using UPI so you all are comfortable phone pay PayPal okay so you all are comfortable with the UPI part all right next is Aadhaar enabled payment service okay now Aadhaar enabled payment service you know uh, uh okay are you able to watch the video is the video clear Yes, because it is uh, showing it was showing error here. Now it's uh, it says that the condition is okay. All right. I believe now you'll be able to see. Yes. Okay, clear, sir. All right. Okay, thank you. So now coming back to the topic, Aadhaar enabled payment service. Now, Aadhaar enabled payment service. You know, uh, you will be able to pay through Aadhaar card. So bank to bank transfer using customer's Aadhaar number. Only by using Aadhaar number, you'll be able to do the transactions okay and finally we have a point on ussd unstructured supplementary service data unstructured supplementary service data okay now for the ones who don't have a smartphone okay so if you remember back in the old days we had when we used to have that nokia phones and with snake game and all okay so when we wanted to check our balance we need to we had to press star one two three hash and something like that okay so this ussd service you know unstructured supplementary service data it works on the star uh, hash function only okay so a, a person without even a smartphone a person uh, without a smartphone and without an internet connection also will now be able to access the banking facilities okay through ussd so what he has to do it is a mobile banking using the basic feature phone it doesn't have to be a smartphone okay and you can access to the banking features using the ni star 99 hash okay so if you type star 99 hash and if your mobile phone is registered with the bank it is going to show you all the banking options okay so even a person without a smartphone and without a phone uh, uh, with a phone that has got no internet connectivity as such will also be now able to let's say uh, access the basic features of his banking okay so these are the four modern methods new methods of uh, payment one is ieps uh, uh, IMPS and second is uh, UPI, third is AEPS, Aadhaar Enabled Payment Service and fourthly we have USSD, okay. So unstructured supplementary service data, alright. So with this, uh, yes, with this uh, our digital uh, payments uh, topic is also over, very simple topic and uh, if a question is asked again it is going to be very easy and bonus for you, okay. Now coming to the third part third part is emerging technologies but before again i start with this uh, emerging technology concept uh, i can see that there are a lot of viewers now watching the lecture if uh, if uh, yes i just want to know just write in the name of the city from which you belong so that i get to know at least okay these are the people from these cities who are watching the video right now okay please write in the name of the cities uh, from where uh, from where you uh, belong to or from where right now you're watching the lectures oh pondicherry great wonderful recently last in december month i went to pondicherry beautiful place chennai chennai all right only three replies nagpur okay great chennai Ravi Agarwal, Guwahati, even people from Guwahati are watching, great. Haryana, Nidhi is from Haryana, Karnal, okay. Chennai, Velour, Tamil Nadu, okay. Super, good to see, good to see people from uh, different parts of the country, great. Tutikon, again Tamil Nadu, great. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for uh, replying. Yes. Okay. Now, uh, fine. Let us uh, get back to our uh, topic. Vijayawada is also there. Great. Superb. 
all right now let us start with the concept of uh, emerging technologies okay when i uh, talk about emerging technologies okay emerging technologies uh, means the latest technologies the upcoming technologies which are there okay so as a because uh, uh, as a chartered accountant you need to be well versed with the technology at least you uh, basic concepts of these technology because it might so happen that your cloud, your, your client is using hi-fi technologies and when you go to the client space and he says my server is there in the cloud, my data is there and all. So you need to understand the concepts, right? So at least the basics of uh, the upcoming, the latest technologies you need to understand. So when I talk about emerging technologies in your syllabus, we need to understand nine different types of technologies. If I'm not wrong, yes, these are nine different types of technologies. Okay. So what are the technologies? Let us first go through the names. Cloud computing is there. We have virtualization, then grid computing, mobile computing, BYOD is bring your uh, own device. Uh, okay. Uh, Web 3.0, Internet of Things, IoT, Artificial Intelligence and Green IT. Okay. So we have nine uh, points here, nine concepts uh, to cover. Okay. Now let us quickly start with the concept of cloud computing. Cloud computing is uh, a big topic. Okay. So let us start with cloud computing. Now in cloud computing, we have to cover again uh, six concepts, six basically topics. First, I'm just going to discuss the concept in brief, very briefly, uh, then characteristics of cloud, then the, the various cloud computing environments, then models. Then lastly, we are going to close the session, the cloud computing topic with by, by discussing the advantages and the disadvantages. Okay. So all of you know what cloud means. Okay. So cloud, the concept, let us discuss. Uh, it is the use of computing resources. Cloud computing is what use of computing resources as a service. Now, the main word which you have to understand here is as as a service okay so who is giving you the service the one who is giving you the service is known as cloud service provider and because you are availing the service you are basically the client you can also be known as the client okay so uh, what is cloud cloud is basically the use of computing resources it says use of computing resources okay now when i say use of computing resources i don't mean only google drive okay cloud you can take hardware on rent you can buy you can use a full-fledged software you can store your data videos etc everything so it basically involves all type of computing resources be it hardware be it software be it your data okay so use of computing resources as a service through a network typically the internet so if you want to access any item any any resource which is available on the cloud you need to have you need to have internet all right okay so we are done with the concept simple okay so see i take around one hour, one and a half hour to explain the concept of cloud but uh, i believe i am assuming uh, my assumption is uh, pretty realistic that at least now because this is a revision session you know the concept okay so let us quickly uh, go ahead with the characteristics of cloud all right we have six points to understand in characteristics first point the cloud is elastic and scalable okay the concept of elasticity and scalability is there now what do you mean by elasticity and elasticity and scalability as and when okay uh, you want as and when the users wants the resources can be increased and decreased okay so the point here is le let me give you an example uh, i am i am i have taken a server on rent on the cloud let's say okay and if uh, let's say i am i am having a web my website on that server if one day on one particular day i have uh, let's say uh, i have launched a sale okay and i'm expecting a good number of uh, i'm expecting a good number of uh, customers on that day okay so what is going to happen as in when the number of users are going to increase the resources now my my resources will automatically increase okay to accommodate the increase in number of users and as in when the users are again going to come down the resources are going to come down by resources i i mean it can be the ram it can be the bandwidth it can be the uh, storage it can be the processor okay so Elasticity and scalability is a concept which is there in cloud. Now, if I talk about traditional systems, this feature of elasticity, elasticity is not available. You have bought an i3 laptop. Okay, now it cannot be elastic. If you want a more powerful system, you have to buy another system. Okay, but in case of cloud, if you want a more powerful system for a temporary period of time also, that can be made available to you. Hence, we call that when, hence we say that cloud is basically elastic and scalable. Scalable means the resources can be expanded and reduced as per the need of the client. Okay. So second point is on demand. See, if I buy a computer, 
I ha it is it becomes a part of my IT infrastructure. Let's say in my office there are 10 computers. If I buy the 11th computer, it is going to become part of my infrastructure. But this services on the cloud, you know, they are on demand. You you need it, you take it, you don't need it, let it go. Okay, so they do not become the permanent parts of your IT infrastructure. All right, so these services are on demand. Now, when I talk about resiliency, this is a point where students will probably remember the headings but they are going to write nonsense in the exam okay so when i talk about resiliency resiliency means that your yeah, availability okay uh, the availability and the reliability of the server is going to be high okay why because you know uh, let's say in my office i have one server if something goes wrong in that particular server probably i'll have a, i'll have some downtime downtime by downtime i mean i'll not be able to work for let's say three hours four hours until the server is restored or recovered okay or repaired all right but in case of cloud you know what is going to happen uh, they have multiple servers because it is the business of the cloud service provider they have multiple servers with them so in case one server fails your work will be automatically shifted to the other server you will not even get to know have you ever uh, seen that your facebook account is not opening and they are showing you that the facebook your account is in this server and the server has malfunctioned so you'll not be able to access the data this never happens okay so even if they have a malfunction in one particular server they are going to immediately shift your work to another server because they have multiple servers with them so i can say that the availability is very high okay and the reliability as such is also becomes high now multi-tenancy means now cloud will be used by many users okay so let's say if i talk about google drive if i say google maps google maps is also cloud-based software so it is at one point of time it will it will be used by multiple users so we call it as multi-tenancy okay and uh, then we have paper use concept paper use is basically uh, that in case of cloud you don't have to pay outrightly as such but you pay only for what you use so whenever you are not satisfied with the services or you want to discontinue you can stop okay and finally we have workload movement so i have already discussed this now what happens in workload movement uh, how many of you know what data center means okay now what happens is let's say if i say this is a data center a data center is a place where all the servers are kept all the servers are kept okay so uh, yeah, I have drawn a very small data center. If I tell you that uh, the the last uh, the recent data center of uh, Facebook, uh, the size is equivalent to fifteen football grounds. The the there's that huge. Okay, so let's say this is a data center, and what happens? Let's say if your particular data is in this server. Okay, so what is workload movement? Workload movement means that your data may be it may be migrated to another server in the same data center now let's say this data center is in uk okay so your workload may be migrated from one server to another server okay but now what happens you know this cloud service providers they keep multiple they keep multiple data centers okay one is in uk and in another part of the globe probably they'll have another data center as a backup okay and they generally keep backups not in the same place because if a natural disaster let's say takes place in uk so if even if they have a backup here it is also going to be damaged okay so they generally keep it uh, at a dis on some other part of the world let's say okay now what i'm trying to say is when i talk about workload movement workload movement includes migration of data from one server to another server within the data center and across data center also and across data center also so this is what workload movement means so what i'm trying to say in case of cloud you know this workload movement will keep on happening it is going to happen but it is not going to hamper your work okay so they might do it for security reasons for cost considerations etc the csp will keep will do it okay so very very important question what are the six very direct question what are the six characteristics of uh, cloud computing elasticity and scalability on demand then we have resiliency multi-tenancy paper use and workload movement okay so we are done with the characteristics i feel this is an important question now let us discuss the third topic what are the uh, what are the various cloud we are going to discuss the cloud computing environment okay so we have four types of cloud computing environment now again mind you that i have seen students making uh, the mistakes in this if models are different okay and environment is different exam models was asked and the student ended up writing environment so please be very cautious very alert if if i talk about models we have three models iaas pws and sws iaas stands for infrastructure as a service pws is platform as a service and sws means software as a service okay so 
now cloud computing we let us first discuss cloud computing environment okay we have four different types of cloud computing environment public private hybrid and community okay and under each of these topics we have to cover four to four pa parts basically first i am going to discuss the meaning okay in all of these we have to discuss this first we are going to discuss the meaning all right as you can see meaning then we are going to discuss the characteristics of public cloud then advantages and limitations okay so we all know what public cloud means okay so in it is an infrastructure that is provisioned for open use by the general public any person can use it now please write some examples in the chat box uh, of any public cloud which you are actually using okay i want to see whether you are actually using a cloud or not so please write some some examples of a cloud if you are using any public cloud okay anita uh, says that you always speak in english it's good other teachers use much hindi uh, all right so if i even anita i have all the lectures in hindi uh, and uh, yes my other videos are on the youtube are in hindi so i'm comfortable in english and hindi both yes google drive so krishna is using google drive okay all right so only one person who uses a cloud yes come on let let me see uh, youtube okay okay is youtube a cloud yes uh, it is a cloud it is a software as a service gmail right gmail okay uh, all right fine fine okay so so infrastructure that is provision for open use by general public this is uh, the meaning okay office 365 okay uh, sneha is using office 365 great this is great okay and what are the characteristics let us uh, dive into the characteristics of public cloud so because we have understood the characteristics of cloud just now we had covered the topic of characteristics of cloud this points will be very easy for you to understand you all know scalability so public clouds are very much scalable okay and they are affordable why is it affordable because uh, many users will be using it so multi tenancy will make it very cost effective for you okay but it says less secure all right now please try and understand when i say less secure it doesn't mean that uh, public clouds are altogether uh, very unsecured uh, very, you know, are not secured at all this is less secured in com as compared to private cloud okay so you are going to understand the characteristics which are mentioned here they are relatively they are basically mentioned in a, a related manner relative manner okay so you need to come the the points here are basically in relation to private clouds and the other in, uh, types of cloud computing environment that we are going to discuss okay all right highly available yes uh, they are available 24/7 and because we covered resiliency if you remember so i told you that the csps have multiple backups with them which makes the entire system highly reliable and availability is also very high and then we have a point on stringent slas now slas means uh, uh, what do you mean by sla sla means service level agreements okay so because public cloud is not owned by me if i avail any service from a public cloud service provider there has to be a stringent agree uh, uh, there has to be a service level agreement okay and it has to be properly followed okay so whenever we why talk about please remember this thing whenever i'll i'll be discussing about public cloud okay or anything related to public cloud you always have to remember that uh service level agreement will be there and stringent service level agreements will be there between the csp and the user and the client okay all right so what are the five characteristics highly scalable affordable less secure highly available and stringent sls all right now what are the advantages now you know what advantages as such you don't have to study only most of the advantages given on our our ici material are nothing but the characteristics okay let's just go through the headings okay it says affordable you all know okay scalable we have already covered it is scalable it is affordable okay no setting up and maintenance obviously uh, if you go for a, any cloud service you don't need to put in your money and build that infrastructure it is readily available the csp is ready with the infrastructure all you need to do is pay with your credit card and the server and the services is going to be yours in a uh, few minutes or few seconds okay all right and strict uh, strict slas are followed so whatever advantages is there you will be able to write the answers only if you understand the characteristics so again as such you don't need to remember the advantages you will be able to write the answer well if you are well versed with the concept okay all right and what is the limitation what is the first limitation that should come into your mind when i talk about public cloud okay so the first limitation is security 
again this point because we had covered less secure again this point is a relative point at this point is in comparison to private cloud now private cloud uh, is more secure so that is why when i talk about public cloud one major concern is security and because of this limitation only we have the other model we have the sorry other environment the private cloud okay and organizational autonomy because public cloud will be used by many organizations okay so one particular organization will not have an uh, identity okay so there will be no organization autonomy as such because it is actually being used by will be used by multiple organizations and it is open to the general public okay so these are the topics just understand the meanings characteristics they may ask you in the exam and advantages and limitations i believe you will be able to write it okay all right so we are done with public cloud now let us start with the private cloud again four points okay so private cloud is infrastructure dedicated to one particular organization you all know this now now what are the characteristics now before i start with the characteristics of private cloud uh, can anyone write in the chat box what are the two variants of private cloud how what are the various types of private cloud basically yes Yes, what are the two variants of private cloud? I'm asking what are the two variants of private cloud? Nobody has replied yet. Okay, so uh, yes. Vijay Lakshmi is correct now. In house and outsourced. Okay, at least you you I I I hope you are you have the book along with you uh, uh, when you are watching the videos. Okay, now everyone is replying on premises and outsourced. Okay, yeah yeah yeah. The, another another name for it can be internal and corporate. Okay, so are you are you guys having your book or not with you? When you are watching the videos, is 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 the material available with you or not? Nidhi says no. Okay. So you should have the material open with you, you no? Know? So this is going to help you. Okay. Uh, yeah, Urmila says yes. Okay. And uh, if you uh, find some of the points given in the chart as yes so if you find some of the points in the uh, chart uh, useful you should keep and immediately note it down in your uh, study material or whatever whosoever material you are using ici material or r material or whatever it is okay anyways all right so yes so uh, let's get back to the characteristics okay i i uh, asked you a question that yes uh, uh, what are the variants of uh, private cloud so all of you have answered yes there are two variants of uh, private cloud one is on premise private cloud and the other is outsourced private cloud so when i talk about on premise private cloud this means that the private cloud has been established by our own organization okay we have incurred the cost and we have erected the entire infrastructure of the cloud okay when i talk about outsourced private cloud this cloud this cloud infrastructure will be owned by a third party but it is going to be exclusively used by my organization so i hope you understand the difference okay so two variants one is on premises and the other one is uh, uh, outsourced or a third party private cloud now why did i discuss this because uh, the characteristics of cloud you know in our module all the three characteristics of cloud all these three characteristics of cloud you know these three characteristics are with respect to in-house uh, uh, private cloud or i can also say on-premise private cloud yeah the all three all these three uh, uh, basically characteristics of private cloud are given from the perspective of in-house private cloud or on-premise private cloud now can i say the in-house private cloud is going to be super secured the the entire infrastructure is with us that all the data residing in the infrastructure is with us we have exclusive control on the entire infrastructure right so uh, security wise this is going to be uh, we can achieve highest level of security in case of on premises private cloud okay we would be having centralized control over over the infrastructure over, over the data also and because please understand this because the infrastructure belongs to us 
the entire infrastructure is there with us we need not maintain any slas at all okay slas is generally maintained with a third party so in case of private public cloud if you remember in case of public cloud public cloud is generally uh, owned by a cloud service provider so in case of csps uh, in case of public cloud if you remember we came across a characteristic uh, that stringent slas has to be there but in case of uh, private cloud we, we can go with uh, weak slas also because we need not make a contract a formal contract with our very own organization okay so we can go with this point that they can there can be weak slas also okay all right now when i talk about the first advantage of private cloud the first thing that should come to your mind is security because the first limitation of public cloud was security and because to overcome this limitation we came up with the idea of let's say private cloud so the main advantage of uh, private cloud is what uh, it should be higher levels of security just remember the word higher levels of security okay now there is one point here cost reduction cost reduction okay please understand this point very uh, this is a, a good form and understanding uh, you need to understand this okay uh, in case of on premises private cloud in case of on premises private cloud this is let's say my infrastructure i am going to incur all the cost i am going to incur all the cost okay had it been this is let's say in house private cloud this is in house okay had it been owned by a third party or let's say csp okay i would only have to pay the rentals okay but in this scenario i have to bear the infrastructure cost infrastructure cost means i have to basically uh, bear the, all the capital expenditure right now my point my point to all of you is don't you think in as compared to this obviously the cost here is going to be very high because i am incurring capital expenditure here okay so in case of in house uh, private cloud the cost is going to be high all right now this no doubt this is a limitation isn't it just a limitation or not so one more point with respect to limitation i'll try and understand make you understand first is investment high investments that means it is going to be i can say it is going to be very costly okay but please understand this that in limitation i have mentioned point costly and again in advantages also i have written cost reduction okay now when i talk about cost reduction in advantages please understand uh, this uh, cost reduction uh, is basically in comparison to the traditional systems this uh, cost reduction is with in comparison to the traditional systems okay in traditional systems you know what happens you need to buy let's say multiple servers okay if you you need to buy multiple servers and uh, uh, let's say you are using only this much capacity of each server so most of your server remains idle but because of cloud you don't need to buy multiple uh, infrastructure what you can do is you can use the concept of virtualization and one server one powerful huge infrastructure you buy and you can split the server you can basically have multiple logical resources out of one physical resource we will we will discuss this concept we call it as virtualization okay so please understand this what i'm trying to say now because of virtualization in in because of virtualization you don't need to buy multiple servers okay so your cost reduction is there and one server average utilization will improve so please understand this point uh, most of the students get confused here when we talk about advantages of uh, private cloud it says cost reduction that is why i have written the reason because your average server utilization will be now better you don't need to buy multiple servers you don't need to buy multiple servers but you can use advanced technology like virtualization and all wherein you can split one physical resource into multiple physical resource okay so now i in this scenario i have three physical resource i have three physical resource but here i have only one physical resource but i can have multiple resources in one physical resource i can have multiple logical resources in one physical resource so because of this i can say the cost reduction is there okay again I, there is my habit i generally try and get into the details but i should keep in mind that this is a revision class okay anyways so yes advantages cost reduction is there better level of security and because the infrastructure will be in our organization we will have better control over our data as compared to a third party or as compared to a public cloud okay all right so limitation investments obviously the capital cost okay this is going to be costly because you will have to incur the initial capital uh, cost okay of creating the infrastructure and all and budgets will always be a constraint okay but in case of third party cloud 
what happens is the infrastructure the maintenance the operations it is all taken care by the csp so we the users the clients we don't have to worry about it okay all right so we are done with uh, private cloud also okay now as because i told you out of public cloud and private cloud you all now know that private clouds are going to be relatively expensive okay all right because in because of multi tenancy in public cloud the the uh, the cost is relatively less okay now what happens in let's what is hybrid let us understand this hybrid is a combination of at least one internal cloud and one public cloud so we are going to have one private cloud okay and uh, then we are going to move to one public cloud now understand the concept okay it, you all know this that it is uh, going to be expensive to have a private cloud and to maintain the private private cloud okay let's say we have very confidential data with us and we cannot uh, we cannot uh, basically use a public cloud so what we do here is for all the data that is important for us we keep all the data and the applications in the internal cloud but in an organization it can never happen that entire data the 100 percent of your data is basically important or critical it cannot happen so let's say only 10 percent of your data was critical so you keep it in the private cloud and remaining portion you basically uh, put all the data in what uh, let's say a public cloud so we now have a combination of private and public so why are we going with this model because if you keep all the unnecessary data also in private cloud it is ultimately going to increase your cost okay so this hybrid model is uh, opted only to minimize the cost yet you get the features of yet you get the features of a private cloud also okay so uh, meaning is what combination of at least one private and public cloud uh, what are the characteristics okay it is scalable now why is it going to be scalable because of the public counterpart okay uh, as i have told you that in case of hybrid cloud we have one private and one public so it is going to be scalable because of the public counterpart we will not say that this is a completely secure system because it has got a public counterpart again so private portion will be more, more secured and the public uh, counterpart you know that public uh, cloud has got its fair share of concerns with respect to security so it we call it as partially secure okay stringent sla why we have stringent slas here because we have involvement of a csp public csp the third party csp here so we need to have stringent slas okay and the fourth characteristics you know uh, the model itself it becomes very complex you have to manage a private cloud also then the data which is not important you have to migrate it to a public cloud sometimes the data in the public may become important so again the lot of migration and transfer of data from one place to another is going to take place so overall the model is going to become very complex okay all right so characteristics done advantages you'll be able to understand highly scalable and it says better security than public cloud obviously big and the second number advantage is because of the private uh, cloud counterpart okay and what is the limitation one limitation it is going to be very complex to manage because we have two we have uh, merged two concepts here okay so hybrid cloud is also over now let us quickly discuss community cloud community cloud is used by the members of one community okay for example the government of india can use uh, one uh, the various departments of government of india can use one server wherein all the let's say uh, Aadhaar number of the citizens are there or uh, PAN card is there. So it can be used by the direct tax department, the indirect tax department, it can be used by MCA also. Okay. So infrastructure provision for exclusive use by a specific community of consumers, specific consumer, specific community of people, they use it. Okay. So what are the characteristics? Yeah. Please understand this community cloud is only going to be useful when there is collaboration, when everyone works in collaboration okay and uh, second is partially secure again why is uh, this partially secure because now please understand this heading we had this heading we had the similar heading here also okay we had the similar heading uh, in hybrid also partially secure but the reason for partially secure in hybrid is different and the reason for partially secure in case of community will be different the reason why hybrid is termed as partially secure is because of the public counterpart but the reason why community cloud is considered as to be partially secure is because of the number of users okay it is not going to be as secure as a private cloud nor it is going to be as less secure as a public cloud so it is going to be at an intermediary level i can say okay so that is why we call it as a partial we call it as partially secure and uh, yes it is going to be cost effective because i am going to basically have the features of a private cloud but 
uh, with some more users so the cost will be divided okay so it is cost effective all right so advantage is more or less the same low cost i can call it as a low cost uh, provide private cloud collaborative work is possible and better security than public cloud so we have better security as compared to public cloud okay and what is one limitation the organizational autonomy will be lost okay so what are the two limitations autonomy is lost okay because there are multiple users now even though the number of users are not as great as public cloud but we have limited number of users so organization autonomy will be lost and it is this model you know it is not going to be suitable when there is no collaboration when you don't have to work together so there will be there, there, there is no point in going with a community cloud then okay so all right so these are the four uh, cloud computing environment that we have just discussed now let us quickly understand the cloud computing models okay we have three models iws pws and sws all right so under iws uh, what is the meaning of iws iws means hardware level service when you are actually using uh, process you, you are using let's say com you take computers hardware on rent you use the servers on you take servers on rent you take the processor you you take the ram this is basically hardware level service okay so infrastructure as a service if i say uh, if you you if you take any server on rent let's say it is an i i it is an example of infrastructure as a service okay so what are the characteristics let's understand um, in order to access any server let's say which you have taken uh, on rent okay uh, we can access that server we can access that particular uh, resource only if we have internet connection so uh, any resource access any access that you want to make it it has to be web access okay it there has to be internet then centralized management the entire system okay when you take uh, when you take let's say server on rent okay let's say i have taken uh, servers on rent from amazon yeah amazon has a separate vertical okay aws amazon web services so i have bought let's say i have taken as infrastructure on rent from aws amazon web service so they are going to manage their infrastructure centrally okay and in order to manage uh, the infrastructure centrally they have uh, they have software which we generally call it as middleware okay so using this middleware they manage the entire infrastructure okay again iws it, it is going to be elastic and scalable as and when you need more resources if you if you are let's say you have taken i3 on rent and you can immediately you can switch to i5 if you can go for multiple processors you can increase ram decrease ram you can increase the size of hard disk etc okay obviously this is going to be shared infrastructure you are going to get one system but it is going to be used by many other users okay and i told you this that one user one user will not this is an infrastructure let's say which you have taken on rent so then you are user a but there will be multiple users who are going to be using that system but because of the concept of virtualization uh, user a will not be able to see okay the user b okay there will be an isolation levels there will be isolation okay all right and metered service is nothing but pay per use so if you use infrastructure on rent okay so this is pay per use concept all right so iws okay you just need to understand the characteristics this is what i feel is important and some examples of iws can be nws is network as a service then we have storage as a service backend as a service uh, data uh, desktop as a service then we have database as a service all these are various instances okay of iws so i feel only the characteristics of iws is important and uh, you know what uh, for for the topics for, for pws and sws pws you only need to know the meaning and they have forgot they basically missed out giving the characteristics of pws and sws so you just have to understand the meaning of pws and sws okay all right so uh, pws you know it is also uh, it is also it is a platform which is actually for the developers please understand this now when i when i develop a software when i develop a software i need to have certain infrastructure okay i need to have certain i, I use certain software okay now uh, if i buy those softwares or if i buy the infrastructure i'll have to incur cost so what has uh, what is pws pws is basically for the developers that they don't need to invest in their technology rather they can use the technology which is actually provided by the csp they can now develop their own software because uh, on the cloud rather than developing the software locally on their machines they can now migrate to the cloud and get the software they can develop the software there okay so it provides the users the ability to develop and deploy applications okay on the development platform development platform which is actually provided by the service provider okay 
All right. right. So this is what PWS means. Nothing more to study. Please remember that platform as a service is for the developers. The developers are actually getting a platform wherein they can develop their own software. Okay. And earlier, what used to happen if I am a software developer, I will have to work on my local machine, local computers and develop the software. And let's say if this uh, laptop is not there with me right now, I cannot move ahead with the coding work. Okay. But now every all the development work is taking place in the cloud. Okay, so this is platform as a service. All right. Now software as a service, you all know that when you get ready made softwares to use, okay, when you get ready made software to use, let's say, for example, Google Maps, you are using Facebook, you are using you are using Gmail, all these are ready made softwares, you are getting the end results. Okay, so these are examples of software as a service, you pay you you pay for what you use. Okay, and most of these services are free, like for example, Google Drive up to 15 GB of data, I think you can uh, use it for free. Okay. So what is the meaning? Let's say it provides the user's ability to access an application over the internet. So full fledged application you, you can access using your internet. Okay. And uh, software as a service, please understand these are softwares that you don't have to download it. Okay. You can use it. You can access it online. All right. So Facebook that you use the application, the small application that you have on your mobile phones for Google Maps and Facebook, they are not the full fledged softwares. Okay. They are merely small apps in order they act as an interface basically the moment you open Facebook you are straight away connected to the Facebook main application the 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 small the app that you have the Google Maps app you have you know the size it is hardly 18 to 20 MB so do you think that the entire world's data can be uh, managed in 18 to 20 uh, MB of data not possible so whatever applications that you have in your phones okay so they are merely an interface that helps you to connect to the main server main software so google maps can be an example of software as a service you don't have to download entire google maps in your computer to use it right okay and what can be the various instances as such it is not very important so please remember that models are different and uh, environment is different when i talk about environment we have four environment when i talk about models we have three models ips infrastructure structure as a service platform as a service and software as a service okay now coming to advantages and disadvantages uh, it is very easy obviously if you go for a cloud okay when we just when we just use the word cloud it is implied that i'm always talking about public cloud okay so it is going to reduce your capital cost because you don't have to create your own infrastructure it is obviously going to man minimize your maintenance and licensing cost for SWS, you don't have to purchase the software, you only pay rentals for it, the pay per use basis. So the licensing cost will also be saved. Okay, pervasive accessibility and globalize the work. These two points are more or less uh, same. Uh, pervasive accessibility means you can access your cloud in from anywhere, anytime. We call it as AA, anywhere, anytime access you can do. Globalize your work because all the data and you know, everything is stored in a central server somewhere so you can globalize your work even if you are in us even if you are in somewhere in dubai you can do the work okay less personal training is required because now the hardware is not there the software is not there everything all the maintenance portion is taken care by the csp the cloud service provider so as such you you don't need to train your employees so it is going to save on your training cost as well okay and improve flexibility you become more flexible okay so these are the six advantages i'm not going to discuss them in detail just remember them and let's discuss the drawbacks also quickly okay so for the first drawback is uh, in order uh, uh, in order to establish connection to the to any cloud i should say that you need to have an internet connection so if internet connection is not good or if let's say you don't have an internet connection at place uh, uh, in uh, active internet connection you will not be able to access your cloud okay when i talk uh, in terms of security this is the second drawback see anything which you keep on the internet okay will always be relatively more vulnerable to attacks okay so uh, no doubt no doubt cloud has got huge advantages but at, at the same time we need to be cautious because anything which is on the internet is more vulnerable okay and because all the data let's say google drive okay you are keeping your important data in google drive but that hardware is not in your control okay it is under the control of csp cloud service provider so you don't have control on the resources okay and then fourth point is uh, 
restrictions okay you you uh, this csp might impose certain restrictions okay what 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 are the restrictions basically let's say if you are using one particular infrastructure you can only use this particular operating software if you want to use this particular operating software you have to use this hardware so all these types of restrictions they can impose okay and finally we have a point inter operability interoperability is the uh, this is an important point please keep this in mind that let's say uh, yes i am i have uh, one application running on please understand this Let, let's say i have uh, yeah one particular application a1 running on uh, cloud provided service provided by aws okay and there is one more application a2 which is running on another let's say uh, uh, cloud let's say csp2 okay let me call him as csp1 okay now what is going to happen here is uh, because uh, this is altogether a different cloud uh, vendor okay Pro it might so happen that the data that resides here okay uh, um, will not be understandable by the systems here okay so there is there is a need for portability basically okay so what what interoperability means okay it is an issue wherein all the applications may reside may not reside with a single vendor and two vendors may have applications that do not cooperate with each other so application two and one are not will not be able to talk to each other because of different formats different types of data different uh, environment altogether so interoperability means that the exchange of information and applications becomes difficult when we have two vendors okay so this is another risk all right so so we have five drawbacks of cloud all right so with this uh, we are covered we have covered all the six uh, topics of cloud uh, what are the topics first is concept characteristics uh, remember in characteristics we have six points cloud computing environment we have cl four cloud computing environments three models we have understood six advantages and five drawbacks okay all right so uh, first major portion is complete this was a huge topic cloud is a big topic all right uh, now i think uh, uh, we will be needing another half an hour and we are going to cover up with the entire uh, remaining topics okay all right so before again i start with the concept of virtualization uh, yes i just want to check how many of you are there please raise your hand or give a thumbs up or write yes all right okay and at the same time uh, i would be grateful if you press the like button as well great great all right fine so yeah it it it, it uh, um, i i should uh, basically appreciate all of you that you you have the capacity to it is almost 2 hours now so you have the capacity to bear me for 2 hours now i should appreciate all of you okay anyways uh, let us start with the concept of virtualization now uh, i have already discussed the basics of uh, virtualization virtualization means what you know virtualization is a basically i can say it is a process uh, it is a technology wherein one physical resource one physical resource we split into multiple logical resource the diagram which i made here we have one physical resource we have let's say one powerful server and uh, we have split the server into multiple logical resource so now it is going to appear that as if we have four systems virtually we have four systems uh, or let's say four users i should i should name it as systems only let's say we have virtually we have four systems now but physically how many systems we have we have one system okay now if you want to understand virtualization practically i have a video on youtube on virtualization uh, search for it and you'll be able to understand how i actually uh, did virtualization on my apple laptop so just have a look at it and you you going to your insights regarding virtualization will be crystal clear okay now two questions that we have to cover from virtualization both the questions are important first we are going to discuss the types of virtualization so uh, one is hardware virtualization network virtualization and storage virtualization so uh, again i'm telling you virtualization means that one physical device we carve it out into multiple logical 
resources or devices so when i talk about hardware virtualization let me just give you an example that uh, for example in my case i have one apple macbook and uh, i wanted to use windows in that also so what i did i virtualized my system i virtualized my laptop and now basically i can use uh, apple systems also and at the same time i can use windows os also so what i have done i have virtualized the hardware okay uh, all right so hardware virtualization is uh, uh, basically again i'm telling you that if you want to gain a under practical understanding of the concept just go and watch that virtualization video okay now again network virtualization when i say let's say what happens here is just remember the word in case of network virtualization we split the available bandwidth okay the available bandwidth is actually uh, splitted okay now when i talk about let's say network okay first let me tell you what what do you mean by bandwidth okay so let's say this is a wire this is a wire through which data passes okay and i'll tell you explain you what network virtualization means okay but first let us understand bandwidth okay so when i talk about bandwidth you know uh, it is bandwidth basically means the amount of data which can pass at in one point of time through the wire okay so what happens you know uh, let's say when we say you no know, our internet speed is high or let's say our internet speed is not good so when i say that my internet speed is not good it means that the bandwidth is low okay so when i say my internet speed is not good it means that only few packets of data are basically traveling through the channel okay and when the persons who have uh, they who have paid uh, for a very good internet plan their bandwidth is high so more data is actually allowed to come into your system at one point of time so we we feel that our internet connection is fast okay so now what i'm trying to tell you is let's say we we have this uh, this is a channel okay so how do we virtualize our wire so what what can be done here is uh, we are going to split the bandwidth okay so we can in this wire we can dedicatedly give let's say the yellow portion to one particular user okay or one particular department or the organization then the blue part this portion only the data of the blue user is going to go through this part so please understand we have one wire here the communication channel we have one but we have divided we have created multiple logical bandwidths okay so it now appears that yellow wire is different blue wire is different but tangible the physical wire channels we are only have one channel so when i so please remember that when i talk about network virtualization just remember one keyword here that the keyword is splitting up the available bandwidth okay so just let me write also if you want splitting up the available bandwidth okay so what happens is physically we have one resource but uh, uh, they have uh, splitted the bandwidth okay and then storage virtualization very simple for example google drive okay you are getting 15 gb of uh, free space now do you think that google will have an exclusive hard disk of 15 gb for you never they will what 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 will be the scenario like they will be having let's say one hard disk which will be used they will be basically they must have carved the hard disk into multiple parts and each part probably will be used by a different user so this is storage virtualization we have one physical storage here which has been actually divided into multiple resources this is the concept okay so i hope you are clear on the different types of virtualization please don't make a mistake we have hardware network and storage i have seen students writing hardware network and software generally when we use the word hardware you tend you you have a tendency to write software also so it is not software it is storage virtualization okay all right so we are done with three types of virtualization now let us quickly uh, understand what are the application areas of virtualization where can a virtualization be used okay so we have five areas first is server consolidation now what happens is i told you this here also okay this point in traditional model in traditional uh, model what happens is let's say we need to buy three we we have to buy three physical servers let's say when there is no concept of virtualization we buy three physical servers and we incur cost for three physical servers but because of virtualization what can be done we can now buy only one physical server and we can virtualize it and basically isolate one part from the other and basically in one physical server we can we can virtualize it in such way that we have three physical resources with us okay so what what is server consolidation means that rather than now buying three physical servers i have consolidated all of them into one server so first point is what server consolidation okay then second is virtualization can be helpful in case of disaster recovery also okay so what happens is please understand okay now 
this 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 application you know uh, of virtualization this is basically application of virtual machines okay so the topic that is given here is uh, application of virtual machines all right so if you have a virtual machine let's say this is our main machine this is a machine this is our server which is uh, there in my office premises okay and if uh, something goes wrong let's say a fire catches or something goes wrong if i have a, a similar machine on the cloud taken on the cloud now this particular machine will uh, this is a virtual machine for me it is not there uh, uh, with me physically this is a virtual machine for me so this will act this will help me in case of a disaster if something goes wrong here if some fire catches or something goes wrong here this is going to serve as a backup so virtual machine helps us in disaster recovery okay third is testing and training okay now please understand again what happens is uh, let's say let's say uh, yeah just just give you an example okay uh, you want to become a pilot okay and uh, 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 you want to become a pilot so on the very first day of your uh, schooling let's say they don't give you a, a, a real plane and they try, tell you okay go try let let's fly this is how you do and this is how you have to uh, land and also they, they don't give you the plane on the uh, real plane on the first day so what they do is they create a simulation of the environment they they basically make you sit in front of a simulator which looks they have all the controls of a plane you will have a screen and then you it works as if it is a real plane okay but it is not an actual plane so what i'm trying to say if we have virtual systems in place it can be used for testing and training okay if if we cannot we cannot afford this is our life system let's say this is our main system we cannot afford to go for test in this systems if we do some kind of testing in this system and something goes wrong it is going to impact our entire systems okay so virtual systems will be helpful in testing and training also okay now if we have virtual systems okay for example software as a service okay software as a service do we have the software in our system no it is a virtual service that we are availing okay so when we have when we use software as a service when we use software as a service basically what happens is uh, our applications become portable that means we will be able to access the application from wherever we want anywhere and anytime access and similarly that google drives and the storage space we use that also becomes portable you don't need to carry your pen drive or hard disk everywhere but if you are storing something on your virtual de de drives on the internet then we say that our uh, uh, workspace has also become portable now please try and understand my point in our book uh, it is clearly given this this is these are the applications of virtualization but please try and uh, understand that virtualization please understand virtualization is a separate technology altogether okay cloud and virtualization are totally different but please understand for for anything to be called as the cloud the virtualization has to be there okay it is only because one virtualization is one of the fundamental aspects of cloud all right please uh, understand that these two are totally separate things but cloud cannot exist without virtualization because i told you that in cloud there are multiple people multi tenancies there so multi tenancy can happen only because of virtualization okay so the concept this topic you know this topic uh, uh, just remember the five heads this topic should actually have been you know what this is not application of virtualization this is basically application you know of virtual machines of virtual uh, systems i can say okay all right now first point is application of virtualization it helps you in consolidation of your server but all the remaining points you know disaster recovery testing and training it is application of virtual machines and basically you you are you are going to create virtual machines using the help of virtualization so ultimately these applications are of virtualization also okay i know it is a bit confusing but yes uh, you have to understand this all right so uh, virtualization we are done with application and types okay again i'm telling you let me remind go and watch the video uh, on youtube good practical insight you will get it is only a 6 or 7 minute video okay now quickly let us uh, come to uh, grid computing okay now what is grid computing uh, grid computing uh, we have to cover four five topics here what happens is uh, generally if i let's say i am using this laptop right now this laptop will not be powerful enough to do uh, humongous task okay so what happens is let's say i want to do a research which will consume huge amount of computing resources okay 
so i need to probably buy a super computer and to buy, buy a super computer i need to incur 3 crores 5 crores uh, let's say uh, i have to shell out this huge amount of money okay so now rather than buying a super computer what i can do is i can request users let's say i can request my students i can request my friends to basically provide me their computing resources when they are not using it let's say okay so what is the meaning of grid it is a technology to harness the computing powers we are harnessing computer powers from various sources and use them in harmony to achieve our goal or objective so whatever research i am doing i'll be able to fulfill if you allow me to use your processor your uh, uh, primary storage ram etc okay so in a way i can say I'll not be needing your systems physically, even if you are in Guwahati or Chennai or Karnal, I'll be able to use your resources by using internet. All you have to do is switch on your laptops and keep it connected to the internet. Okay, so we have certain platforms for grid. All right. Okay. Now, what are the types of resources that can be used in grid? Let us understand this. Okay. Yes. All right. So we can, uh, I can access basically computation. Now computation means processors. Okay. Computation, I can access, I can use your processors. I can use your storage. Now, when I talk about uh, computation, computation, uh, if you want, uh, yes, these are processors. Okay. All right. When I talk about storage, it includes primary storage as well as secondary storage. By primary storage, I mean RAM. Okay. And secondary storage, you all know hard disk and all. So now communication is also a type of resource that is a uh, uh, that can be used in grid because uh, how am i going to send you the data how am i going to use your resources and also we need to have communication also okay so third third point third resource which can be shared in grid is basically communication okay communication is useful for sending jobs and receiving the jobs then software and licenses let's say we are we are a team let's say uh, of 100 members in a grid okay so i have purchased one particular software so all the members of the grid if the license allows will be able to access my software so you all all the other users probably will not have to buy a software and install it in their particular computers okay and special equipment and architecture can also be shared now for example let's say generally this grid you know the scientists and all they form it okay now let's say a scientist in uh, us has formed a grid and it has got scientists from all across the globe the the grid has members from different parts of the world okay so there is one us scientist and there is one uh, japanese scientist also okay and the japanese scientists they have a special equipment with them okay so the japan the american scientists you know what they can do is they want to test something so they can physically send the sample to the japan uh, to the japanese scientist and the japanese scientist then will keep the sample on the equipment and the equipment now can be controlled by the scientists present in america okay so what i'm trying to tell you is in grid what are the resources that can be shared so it can be the computation the processors it can be the storage the communication the softwares as well as any special equipment that is available so this can be asked in the exam what are the five what are the different types of resources that is shared in a grid okay now coming to the concept of what are the benefits okay now let us quickly understand the benefits yes so what happens is please understand now you know what you you let's say i ask you to provide me your resources i ask you to give me the resources of your computers okay so you have purchased your laptop you have incurred let's say good 35 to 40 thousand rupees but you don't use your laptop to the maximum of its capacity most of the times you don't even use it so what happens is when what are the what is the first benefit of grid that rather than buying rather than me buying more computers it is better if I use your underutilized resources. What is the point of wasting more money and buying more resources when our already existing resources are not fully utilized? So grid helps in basically making use of those underutilized resources. Okay. Then we have resource balancing. Now, when I talk about uh, resource balancing, it means that uh, in a grid, you know, in a grid, let's say I have hundred members. So, uh, uh, if, if if let's say we have 100 members you know so uh, sometimes work can be scheduled i can i can basically use the resources of a computer which is most idle basically i will not be using that computer which is relatively occupied so resource balancing concept is there okay all right third is parallel cpu capacity now when i use a grid okay let's say uh, let me draw a diagram okay let's say let me draw a small grid let's say i have a grid of uh, consisting of five computers only okay and one particular work let's say 
what I have done, I have uh, broken the big work. I have uh, big, basically divided a big work into smaller tasks, and each of these systems are basically working on that task. Okay, so can I now say that I have? Can is it good enough to say that I have four CPUs working parallelly for me or not? Yes, these are four machines that are working parallelly for me. So rather than me buying one particular big super infrastructure, super computer, I have multiple processors now working for me. So this benefit is known as parallel CPU capacity. Okay, then we have virtual resources and virtual organization for collaboration. Now, all right, please understand this. So the 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 Japanese, the Japan scientists and the uh, in my example, American scientists, American scientists and the Japan scientists, they collaborated basically. They were working together, but they might not belong to the same organization. The American scientists might belong to NASA. The Japanese scientists might belong to some other organization. So there is collaboration, but this virtual organization is formed. Okay, so this grid, you know, the members can be from different parts of the globe, but yes, there is a community form which is virtual in nature. Okay, then. Apart, okay, access to additional resource, please understand this. What are the resources that can be shared in grid? We have already covered. Okay, there are six resources which I have taught you. Five resources. One is computation, storage, communication, software and license, etc. So apart from this, you know, additional resources can also be accessed. For example, like the internet. Okay, now let's say in South Korea, the internet speed is very, very high. Okay, they have amazing bandwidth. The speed is so extremely high. So if if we want to do a research work, I can probably give more portion of the research work to the scientist present in Seoul or in South Korea so that so that he can execute the work because the speed of internet there is more. So in a way, can I say that I am virtually using his internet connection or not? Yes. So along with the resources that you have just covered here, when I say access to additional resources, it means I can also access internet. Okay. Now coming to the point of reliability. Okay. Now when I say about when I uh, when I um, talk about let's say my traditional systems, okay, I can make my traditional systems very reliable. I can uh, let's say uh, I can buy multiple UPS so that if there is a power failure, uh, I'll still be able to continue my work. So I'll be able, I'll have to incur cost. Okay. So in order to make my traditional systems more and more reliable, I'll have to incur cost. Okay. But if I compare it with grid, okay, grid as such doesn't um, require us to invest further in the technology. Okay. Everyone has it go got its own share of technology and in a way without incurring much, much of uh, expenses, your grid becomes reliable. Okay. And uh, seventh is management. It is easy to manage a grid. If someday, let's say, uh, you are you are contributing the uh, resources okay you have given me your computer to use okay now let's say someday you have an urgent work so if you don't want to contribute you can stop and someday on saturdays and sundays let's say you want to contribute more because your laptop is relatively free so that also can be done so grid management can be done easily okay so these are the benefits please remember now grid can is a bit technical topic but uh, I hope you we we have discussed this concepts in detail in class. I know I am not discussing the concepts as such. I am just going through the headings and I am uh, basically uh, trying to help you to recall the concepts. Okay, all right. So benefits is done. Now uh, the, now another area which I feel is important. Uh, three or four a small question can be asked is application areas of grid. So who uses a grid? So it can be civil engineers, the insurance company, they can use it. Application service providers. So this can also be asked. Not that important, but I feel in grid two most important questions which you have to cover is what are the types of resources that is uh, used in grid? And secondly, what are the benefits of Great. These are the two important questions that you have to understand. Okay, so with this, uh, uh, with this, we have covered three major concepts. Now the remaining concepts is not going to take much of your time. Uh, very simple concepts, but cloud virtualization and grid are relatively uh, huge. Okay, now quickly and let's start with mobile computing. Okay, three topics you have to cover here. Now first, what is mobile computing? Please. Uh, don't think that uh, it is only related to your cell phones. Mobile computing can be uh, computing. It is a technology basically which uh, helps in transmission of data whenever you are using any device which is portable in nature. So it can be your tablet, it can be your mobile, it can be your small laptops that you use uh, these days. Okay. So what do you mean by mobile computing? Please remember it is a technology that allows transmission of data without the need to be connected to any fixed physical link. Okay. All right. Now, very important question. What are the components of a mobile computing? So we have three components here in order to ensure 
communication mobile communication we need to have mobile communication that means infrastructure okay we need to have a hardware we need to have this hardware okay so this is the hardware this hardware is not going to run unless we have a software in it so this is a software running also but this hardware and software is going to be useless if there is no infrastructure no network service provider if there is let's say i stay in a place where there is no mobile phone towers at all okay or where there is no inter there is no mobile connectivity at all so my um, uh, my uh, this hardware will be of no use because i'll not be able to send and receive data so mobile communication by mobile communication i mean we need to have the infrastructure we need to have the infrastructure okay all right so these are the three components now what are the benefits of mobile computing very simple we have five benefits of mobile computing but uh, yeah so first is if uh, if if we go for mobile computing concept it will make your workforce your employees in the organization mobile they will be able to work from anywhere from the client's place from home etc okay and so your workforce becomes mobile it facilitates ex excellent communication okay now the managers because I, let's say i have given all my employees an ipad so and they go for they, they have gone to the market to fetch orders from the customers so they'll be able to punch the orders in real time in their ipad and the management at the back office will be able to see okay yes we have received an order in real time basis so excellent communication okay and because of this excellent communication the management effectiveness is going to increase okay now a person who has been given let's say an employee has been given an ipad okay from that ipad anywhere he'll be able to access two things one is corporate service and information let's say he's sitting with a prospective customer and the customer asks some questions with respect to the product so he can immediately uh, open uh, basically switch on his ipad and he can immediately access our corporate services and information and gain knowledge about the product and communicate immediately to the prospective customer okay and he can then gain access to the corporate knowledge base also okay so there are two points of access access to corporate service and information and then there is access to corporate knowledge base now what is knowledge base let us let me give you an example let's say i, I have a ca firm and there is a uh, new amendment so we discuss the amendment with all the team members okay and we create a pdf of it and we save it in our systems so now one any any person from our team let's say he is at a client's place and all and he wants to look into the amendments he doesn't need to now google and search for the amendments because the amendments are readily available in our server so he's going to just go and uh, look at the document and he's going to update his knowledge so we call it as knowledge base okay so knowledge base is nothing but a database containing knowledge okay all right so five points uh, uh, benefits you have to remember now limitations again important six limitations okay i just uh, told you the concept of bandwidth so you all know that you all understand this that mobile computing when i talk about let's say uh, 4g or 3g the bandwidth is relatively less as compared to uh, my let's say uh, broadband internet don't you agree with this yes so in case first limitation is that in case of mobile connectivity mobile uh, internet the bandwidth is not sufficient okay then power consumption uh, this is a simple point that yeah this these these devices they totally work on power backup so if the power the ba battery dies okay so if the battery dies the device is dead okay all right transmission interferences now sometimes what happens uh, when we are in a lift or let's say when we're in the basement of a building or when we are uh, driving uh, through tunnels okay so there are interferences the the connectivity is lost so this is transmission interference okay then potential health hazards we should never uh, use the phones and drive okay and it is said that you should not keep the phones close to your uh, uh, pillow while sleeping okay the ones who use uh, medical devices the ones who use pacemakers they shouldn't be keeping mobile phones in this pocket okay so so uh, there are uh, allegations that these devices may cause potential health hazards okay now next is human interface with the device please don't confuse with interferences this is transmission interferences okay and fifth point is human interface now when i talk about interface interface means how i connect with the system okay so let's say i need to write a 10 page uh, topic okay now when i want to write a 10 page topic you know i it is going to be a, it is not going to be very comfortable for me to type it in my mobile phone as soon as i know that it is it is going to be a 10 10, 10 page document i'll shift to my laptop or a computer okay so human interface uh, is a challenge okay when you because the devices are small so writing big notes or lectures or documents it can be time consuming okay and it can be 
very uh, i can say it will drain out your energy and it is going to take time all right and last limitation is security standard see uh, if if anything which is connected to internet let be it your broadband or through mobile now mobile connect if you are connected uh, to the internet using your mobile data or anything then also you need to be worried about the security part because uh, anything which is connected to internet has got a share of concerns regarding security so in case of mobile connectivity also security standards has to be there okay if it is not there it is going to be uh, basically the consequences uh, will not be great okay so mobile computing three important topics components benefits and limitations okay all right now the next concept is byod bring your own device okay under this concept again we have two major topics advantages and threats advantages and threats so let us first understand the meaning okay byod please remember that byod is not a technology i have seen students writing or telling me that by is a technology mobile computing was a technology but byod is a policy it is a policy of an organization of a company that allows employees to use their preferred computing devices okay so you can use your whatever devices any device of your choice you can bring it to the office and you can use it okay now if this if this policy is adopted by a particular company what are the benefits that is going to uh, accrue to that company so let us understand the advantages now so yeah if you are allowed to use your uh, preferred devices the employees are going to be happy okay and when the employees are going to be happy these two points are with respect to employees so when the employees are going to be happy it is going to increase the employees efficiency okay now these two points particularly point number three and point number four i feel these two points are with respect to the organization now uh, the company will not have to incur huge amount of cost on buy in buying computers because users, the employees will be bringing their own devices. So I'll have lower IT budgets and when the devices are not owned by me, the devices are yours. I'll not have, I'll basically save on providing the maintenance and the support aspect also. So I'll not have need to have a team to provide support to the technical help uh, to the users okay so two points with respect to cost it is going to lower my IT budgets and lower support requirements okay and finally early adoption to new technologies now this particular point is beneficial from the angle both both the employees as well as the company okay so early adoption of new technologies uh, uh, see generally if an employee adopts a new technology uh, and the productivity of the employees increase so it is ultimately going to benefit the company okay so this particular point is uh, beneficial both from the angle of uh, the employee as well as the company okay so these are the five advantages but along with this uh, advantages we have certain threats also in this policy okay what are the threats we have four threats okay this is an important question please remember uh, network risk, device risk, application risk and implementation risk. Now, what happens is in case of bring your own uh, device policy, you know, uh, 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 what happens is people generally they bring their preferred devices and uh, sometimes it may so happen that uh, uh, the device is not uh, visible in the corporate network. Okay, now what is going to happen? Try and understand because you are using your own preferred devices. Now, generally, the scenario of office has also changed. If you if you must have seen the Google's workplace, the, the concept of the traditional cubicles and you wearing formals and sitting in one particular place, it has gone. The, 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 gone are those days, okay? Now, people generally work by lying on the couch if you want to lie on the bed and work in the office that is also available there are uh, there are basically uh, uh, sun bath chairs also along the side of the pool you can sit on the high bar chairs also and work this so the this is the culture that has uh, evolved now the point is let's say you are using this particular device to for the office work and uh, somehow what happens you have been working but you uh, because now uh, you can work from anywhere anytime you are in the office premises but you go near the pool or you go to the cafeteria area let's say okay so the chance here is you know what uh, as compared to traditional systems where all the computers were lying at one place the the visibility of all the computers was there in the network we i was able to uh, determine that yes all the hundred computers are connected to the network but now because of byod uh, network risk is basically you know what lack of device visibility i'll not be able to analyze which device are connected and uh, yeah uh, which ones are not connected and you know what can go wrong let's say this device was connected uh, five minutes ago and because of this device a virus has come into the entire network okay and then again five minutes down the line i just five minutes later i move out of the organization so 
what is going to happen a virus has come into the network okay but the device from which the virus came in this device is no longer is connected so even if a scan is run uh, if you if the uh, management runs a scan on the entire network it is going to clean but the device will still have the virus so next time again when it is going to connect the virus will again spread okay so this is network risk now device risk because when i talk about uh, your preferred devices let's say ipad your mobile phones these devices are small in size and uh, generally the chances of you losing this device is also relatively high so when i talk about device risk it is loss of device okay and if your device is lost basically your confidential data data of the company might be leaked okay application risk is risk uh, risk basically with respect to application so uh, yeah you may you because now you are using your own devices you might be having multiple applications so there might might be virus in your system application virus and worms okay and if there is virus in your system it it and you connect it to the corporate network it might basically multiply and it might basically spread in the network okay and last point is basically uh, with respect to implementation okay so uh, you know what byod uh, uh, is a buzzword okay everyone is going with uh, the concept of byod now just because your competitor has gone with the byod policy it shouldn't be like that you also copy and go for byod if it is actually beneficial for you then go ahead with a byod byod concept but you need to frame a byod policy and ensure that it is properly implemented okay then only the byod is going to be successful all right so four risk we have in byod first is network risk then device risk application risk and then we have implementation risk okay all right so two major concepts that you need to understand in byod is advantages and threats done all right <coughs> Now let us understand three concepts together web 3.0 IOT and AI all the three concepts are related okay now what is web 3.0 web 3.0 is basically uh, I can say it is the third generation of internet okay www you all know so uh, 3.0 is basically a uh, third generation of internet wherein please understand web 1.0 was static in nature users were not allowed to post anything on the internet okay you can only read the information you cannot upload any information web 2.0 basically it allowed users also to upload things web 2.0 basically the era when youtube started facebook started okay youtube allowed users to upload videos okay and other users can see like and share and comment okay so there was collaboration between people the objective of web 2.0 was to enhance the communication capabilities and collaboration between people but now web 3.0 is what it is a third generation of internet service that will focus on using a machine based understanding of data to provide a data driven and semantic web now what is going to happen what has happened because of web 2.0 you know a lot of data has been accumulated on the internet a lot of data tremendous huge volume of data is there on the internet now now what happens is when you search something on the internet a lot of irrelevant things might also be shown to you okay so web 3.0 basically deals with this scenario now whatever th this is a basically uh, an intelligent web so what it does is uh, it basically will give you only those results which are relevant to you okay and how does it know that this these are the things which is relevant to you it is actually going to monitor you it is actually going to take data from you analyze the data and give you the results accordingly okay so generally if i if i let's say if i use uh, if i use a word let's say bank okay and generally i when i search when i whenever whenever i write bank and then let's say i click the hdfc bank website so next time when i search google uh, bank on google it is always going to show me bank which is basically a financial institution it is never going to show me riverside of riverside basically riverside is also known as bank or not but someone let's say you are more interested into a you want to uh, there is lockdown is going and you want to draw a picture of a riverside you search for riverside uh, beautiful locations and all so third second third fourth time fifth time probably it is going to show you pictures of rivers or all right whenever you search for bank so what i'm trying to say is web 3.0 is intelligent web and it analyzes data and then produces the data so that you can take a good decision okay so only one question that you have to cover here is what are the two components of web 3.0 one is semantic and the second is web service now when i talk about semantic semantic means nothing but data driven so it is going to give you results on the basis of data who provides the data the data will be provided by you only the data will be provided by you okay and it is a web service okay there is uh, uh, 
when i say web service there is a computer to computer interaction okay that supports computer to computer interaction you provide the data it is going to be analyzed by some machine and they are going to uh, share the required relevant data with you okay so it is web enabled web service so these are the two components of uh, web 3.0 now because of web 3.0 now when i say web 3.0 it means intelligent uh, uh, web okay so because of this you know <clears throat> the concept of iot and artificial intelligence has evolved now what is iot because of web 3.0 now earlier internet was limited or confined to let's say uh, laptops desktops and then came the era of mobile phones okay but now if you see because of web 3.0 because of computer to computer transmission of data okay all things now any damn thing you think about can be connected to the internet okay so now the watches can be connected to the internet now watch my watch has the capability to send data to the device to the mobile there is no human interaction okay so internet of things means what when the devices are capable of sending and receiving data so my ac my car refrigerator the the washing machine that i am using all my home appliances now are connected to the internet so now let's say it is august month very hot year and uh, six o'clock in the evening i am i'm coming home but before coming only i can switch the ac from my mobile phone because now ac is also connected with wi-fi with my internet okay so they understand data and they act accordingly so this is an iot so wh where where is where can iot be used basically internet of things in your home appliances in office mach machines the government can also use it research study it can be used in variable wa variables also like this apple watch or any data sending fitbit anything you use okay now government and all they are also using the iot if you i just quote an example that the dustbins that are there in under the swatch bharat abhiyan now the dustbins have got a sensor when the dustbin basically there is a sensor and when, when the when the garbage inside reaches to that level a notification is sent to the concerned department and they come and they clean the dustbin and take take out the garbage so just imagine the things that now can be connected to internet anything that you think can think of can now be connected to the internet okay but along with this now what are the various risks now let us understand the risk okay so we have six risk here uh, first is environmental risk okay so generally what it is generally said that the the more devices that we have the more transmission of data that is uh, happening uh, it basically pollutes the uh, the air quality okay and uh, it generally there are studies which shows that it causes all the more stress okay because there are waves going on all right so there are there is environmental risk here then second is technology risk okay when i talk about technology risk uh, please understand this means that there are there can be uh, uh, hardware and software variances okay when i talk about technology risk there are hardware variations and differences in the software running on various devices and it leads to platform fragmentation so what happens is let's say uh, let's say i buy an ac just a uh, just a simple example i buy an ac uh, and uh, thinking that yes it is an internet enabled ac and they don't have an app for apple phone let's say i'm using an apple phone they don't have an internet uh, app for apple phones okay so there is a difference no it only runs in android so there is a hardware and it runs only on a particular software so technology risk is there probably you buy something and you don't have the needed technology to run it okay so generally uh, just remember the word platform fragmentation when there is a difference in the hardware and software okay they are not compatible obsolescence you know what uh yes uh, companies which want to bring a new product may force users to dump their old products now forceful obsolescence is done you know what happens is uh, uh one 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 particular risk is obsolescence generally if you see that uh, whenever it happens like after you use your phone for two years or three years generally and there is an update <clears throat> So when you update your phone your phone becomes slow and it becomes so slow after some point of time you don't feel like using it okay so generally what happens is the manufacturers they forcefully obsolete your phone okay um, if, the, if if everything runs smoothly when um, you are not going to buy a new phone right so forceful obsolescence is done okay there is one risk from the perspective of manufacturer also that if the manufacturers they don't incorporate the features of iot in their uh, in their products they may soon run out of business because everyone will want to buy those products that are internet enabled okay all right internet risk is there now what see again anything i told you anything which is connected to internet uh, 
is vulnerable okay so probably i am in my room and i am relaxing the ac is uh, at a very pleasant temperature now the hacker can access my ac and he can increase or decrease the temperature and play with the ac so internet risk will always be associated all of a sudden my washing machine starts it might so happen because uh, when things are connected to the internet the intruders can play havoc okay and then privacy now you know uh, obviously our, pre our privacy will also be intruded somehow now the ac will is knowing that okay i come at uh, come to the place at 6 pm i have said the i might set uh, something like this that every evening at 6 pm the ac should be on so probably if the ac knows that at 6 pm i should be i i'm home generally and uh, the ac will be on 9:30 9:45 every time i switch off the ac before leaving for the office so ac now knows like, that yes 9:40 9:30 he leaves the house so our private private lives okay our private affairs are generally now no more private okay so every every uh, technology uh, everything that is now connected to the internet probably knows where we are okay all right so these are the six risk okay and application areas we have just covered under iot so iot basically two topics you have to cover application and risk okay then there is a concept of artificial intelligence okay now when i talked when i discuss about uh, 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 iot Please understand that IoT cannot work, Internet of Things cannot work without Web 3.0 and AI. So when we discuss IoT, please remember Web 3.0 and Artificial Intelligence are two essential components which has actually enabled IoT to happen. Okay. So and what is Artificial Intelligence? Artificial Intelligence is uh, basically a study, a research field wherein computers are able to think and act just like humans okay so when we try and do something uh, when uh, make something or it's a i can call it a, a software let's say which tries to imitate the human behavior or aspects okay i call it as artificial intelligence okay now when i talk about artificial intelligence uh, uh, the artificial intelligence can be used in aircrafts okay so uh, autopilot is ai basically when you play games chess game you are playing with a computer they they just play just as if there is a human being okay so that there is a concept of artificial intelligence then there are computers which basically uh, ask for your symptoms and they prescribe you the medicine so rather than consulting a doctor you can go and uh, basically uh, use this uh, machines okay so many examples of ai is there but uh, as such we have to remember uh, two concepts here first is the risk and then machine learning can be asked for a short note okay so yes now incorrect data now first risk is with respect to incorrect data if something wrong is fed into the system the processing will be wrong and the output will also be wrong so let's say uh, just as assume that in case of autopilot in flights if some incorrect data is fed basically you are i am flying from Guwahati to chennai and so if if some incorrect data is fed probably i land in hyderabad or some other place also okay because the flight is automatically going to drift and tilt and basically land in that particular area okay so incorrect data will lead to incorrect processing and incorrect output will lead to incorrect decision making okay so and point is artificial intelligence machine may start controlling humans soon okay uh, you have seen this in movies also so generally all the experts are of the view that uh, we have to have a kill button you must have seen in the movies that all the robots and all we need to incorporate we need to manufacture them with a kill button so in case they they try to be basically they try to dominate us we have a kill button okay and when when everything is done by uh, machines when they have the capabilities to think and act like humans probably our thinking capability will deteriorate okay so it may kill human skills of thinking okay so we we will be, we will become lazy and our thinking capabilities will go down drastically this is what experts believe okay so we have three risk with respect to artificial intelligence iot also we covered risk okay please remember in iot we had covered six risk and uh, in case of ai there are three risk that you have to understand okay and finally we have a short note on machine learning uh, machine learning please understand it is a type of ai it is a type of artificial intelligence and it provides computers with the ability to learn to learn by themselves without being explicitly programmed okay so when i bought this phone let's say i bought this phone and there is siri in this phone okay so uh, 
when i bought this phone apple doesn't recognize the company doesn't know my voice and incorporated okay to un, in, un, and basically uh, i can say uh, program siri in such a way to understand so that siri understands my voice but what happened is after i bought the phone siri makes me uh, speak 5 or 10 sentences and siri adopts itself siri learns my voice basically it understands my voice so what i'm trying to say now these days the softwares have the capability to learn by themselves okay so this is the concept of machine learning so it provides computers with the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed okay and coming to the final portion coming to the final topic uh, yes we have uh, we are left with uh, green it this is a very simple topic i never cover it also just just remember green it means that because the use of computers are increasing day by day we have to think from the perspective of environment also when any computing resource is manufactured right from the time you manufacture it till the time you use it and ultimately dispose it you you need to be worried about the environment you need to take care of the environment okay so just remember the best practices for green it it, it says uh, develop a sustainable green computing plan we need to have a green computing plan in our organization we need to recycle things okay we need to make environmentally sound purchase decisions don't buy those things which can be hazardous to the environment uh we shouldn't buy those resources which are developed from materials which are hazardous to the organization okay uh, reduce paper consumption in office uh, we should use both sides of the papers we should use smaller font so that optimum utilization of paper can be done and we need to conserve our energy and resources we, we need to power off our machines when uh, we are not using it for long period of time okay and uh, we need to use uh, laptops rather than desktops we need to use led lcd monitors rather than using those bulky cathode ray tubes monitors those huge monitors they ultimately consume more energy also and space also so all these are best best practices just go through the points we have five points here okay so with this uh, the entire topic of uh, chapter number 4 is over please um, again i am telling you this is not a very big topic again you have time uh, till your uh, you have time uh, for your june attempt so i would request if you have doubts just uh, just go through the video on youtube the videos will be there for you okay and again uh, i hope the session was helpful uh, would be beneficial to you okay we would soon be coming with uh, chapter number 5 probably in a, a day or two's time only we'll be coming with chapter number 5 okay so any doubts if you have please write it in the comment box right now so that i can reply any doubts if you have and once once this once we uh, end this session and uh, once the video is processed and uploaded please if you really like the video please comment and please share okay all right most welcome anita most welcome so any doubts you have yes all right so i believe uh, uh, all of you are intelligent enough you don't have any doubts and uh, yes again uh, if you have any doubts uh, you can contact me on whatsapp and telegram i would be more than happy to help all of you okay thank you so much uh, it was thank you for being wonderful listeners and patient listeners i should say and uh, it was a great session for me at least uh, thank you and i'll see you soon bye bye good night